We find ourselves in probably the most difficult part of the Tishma of service. And that is that we have to recite right now what's called the Kinois. I think in English, the real translation is called Lamentations. There are supplications that we offer to our Kodesh Baruch Hu to try to express our deep pain and loss over the Beis HaMikdash. Kinos also encompass ideas about all the different goluses, the exiles that the Jewish people have gone through all of these years, describes the faults in our nation, the weaknesses in our lack of strength that we have. And the kinos are something that is very foreign to us. We don't understand the words. We don't understand all the poetry that is involved in them. We don't understand why this one is the all the olive base, this one only half of the olive base, this one focuses on this and this one focuses on that. So what we've done over the years to try to facilitate that we should take something out of the kinois, not just that the kinois should take something out of us after so many hours of saying words that we don't understand, is that we follow the words of the Shulchan Aruch, which says, Toiv ma'at bekavana, it is better to say, a little bit of tachanunim, a little bit of supplication and, t- and tefillah to Hashem, the kavana with intention. May harba is belay kavana than to have a lot without kavana, without intention. Meaning, we could sit here, we could go through the entire Sefer of Kinos together. It will take us about an hour and a half, two hours. You'll recite and say a lot of things. But with the lack of kavana, with the lack of intention, so then what is the benefit going to be to any of us that are sitting here? But it will focus in a little bit, maybe five, maybe six, maybe seven, maybe eight. We'll see how it goes today. So then those few that we eventually say at the end of an explanation understanding, it's toif, it's better in the eyes of our Kodesh Baruch Hu. And the Mishnah Bruh brings down over here the following idea. He says that if a person is a Baal Torah, which means that they are someone that could learn they can understand, they're aware of the wisdom of the Torah. <clears throat> so it could very well be that they are exempt from saying hard and many, many different supplications that other people do when they pick up their sitter and they say in the morning. If you could learn, if you could understand, if you can allow the words of the Torah to affect you, that he says is possibly even more important than, than some of the tefillahs that we, that we offer up. But one thing he says is for sure. No matter what level a person is on in their life, no matter where they're holding in their Yiddishkeit, no matter where they're holding in their abilities to learn, everybody, every single day has an obligation to carve out for themselves some time to learn a little bit of Musa Hashem, to learn the words of inspiration, of ethics, of morality, of 
working on oneself. Everybody has an obligation to do that because the Yetzirah is so strong and it's so powerful. Whether you are a simple Balabas sitting in Tarzana, California, or you are Rosh Hashiva in Me'asharim, everybody has a Yetzirah and everybody has to work on themselves. So whether we say a lot or whether we say a little, Musa is something that nobody could have seen. So today in the Kinois, I hope that it, the way that it works out is that there's a, a message that we're going to walk away with to speak about, yes, of course, that we have to own up for ourselves over the year. We have to own up for ourselves over all of the years of the travels of Gullus, of the exile. At the same time, there's a message of hope and there's a message of the vision of Claudia. So there's a message of be, believing that any single moment, any single moment, when HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants to, he's going to bring Mashiach Zidkeinu. And if we'll take the Tachanunim and we'll take the Kinois to heart, those that we focus in on and that we struggle through, and we take the words of Musr, of uh, rebuke, it's okay to be rebuked a little bit. If we don't have some criticism, and we don't get rebuked a little, how are we ever going to grow? Remember when I was in Yeshiva in Eretz Yisrael, it was the custom of my Rosh Yeshiva to rebuke the Bachim in the Yeshiva. He would come often, depending how much he loved you. The more that he loved you, the more that he, re he would rebuke you. So, Baruch Hashem, I was very loved. <laughs> and as a result of that, there were things I could not get away with because it was always under the watchful eye. And when, when I came to America, so the minag in America is not to rebuke because maybe you'll hurt somebody, maybe they're too fragile, maybe they'll crack like an egg, so you can't get rebuked. So one time after many, many years of being in, in yeshiva in America, my Rosh Kola got very upset with me because I was annoying him extensively on a certain a particular topic. And he mustered me out in his office. And I was so shocked. I said, thank you, Rebbe. And he said, thank you. I just got upset with you. I said, yeah, you're the first one who got upset with me in three years since I'm here. So a little bit of muster, a little bit of rebuke, a little bit of criticism will allow us to be able to focus in on ourselves on this day of Tisha B'Av, which is what the day is all about. It's supposed to be for introspection. It's supposed to be for growth, and it's supposed to be a day that, as we said in Eicha last night, it's a mayad, it is a convocation, it's a meeting place, that one day Be'ez Hashem is going to be a yomtiv for all of Klal Yusuf. So as has been the custom, we, we utilize different mefarshim, different commentators, very often delving into, and if you look inside all of the kinos, you will find that there are psukim, there are verses, from Eicha that appear in almost every single one. And the commentators on Eicha are many with beautiful insights. So we'll try to use the words of Eicha to explain what is going on in each of the, the keynotes that we're going to learn together. I'm going to start this year from the beginning. I don't remember the last time we started from the very beginning, which is Kino Vav, number six. And I also would like to just point out in advance that I plan to use extensively the parish, the commentary of Rav Chaim Kanievsky, Zeches Alev Divracha. This is the year that we're still within the year that he passed away. And it's clear from his writings and it's clear from the Hanhagas, the way in which he approached the three weeks, that this was a, this was a person who had a very deep, deep understanding of what the Chorban, of what the destruction of the Temple was, about what it means not to have a Beis English in the world. He was machmir in many, many areas of the halacha where we're always looking for leniencies during the three weeks. How many times do you get called? The rabbanim get called. So if I need to swim, so I'll be a happy person. Am I allowed to swim during the nine days? You know, I'm, I'm uh, walking down the street and there's a lot of noise on the street. Could I put my ear, pod, ear pods in and listen to music? Some good uh, heavy rock and roll over there to make me feel better? Like these are the, everyone's looking for a cooler. You know, I, I, got a new suit, and I didn't get a chance to get an altar, but if I don't wear it, all different things. If Chaim Kanievsky was machmed to the T, to the extent that although he might every single place in Shulchan Aruch and, and the place him say that you're not allowed to wear freshly laundered clothing uh, during the nine days. So we wear in our clothes beforehand. Whether you put them on for a little while, whether you step on them on the floor, whether you sit on them, but you're not supposed to wear freshly laundered clothes in the nine days, except for Shabbos. But undergarments, 
socks and, and undershirts and underwear and the like, those pretty much everybody says that's not a problem. Those are just to catch the sweat. So there's no issue over there of wearing them in before the nine days. Rav Chaim Kanievsky was marked to the T that even on the undergarments, to feel the korban, to understand that he wasn't wearing something that was freshly laundered and freshly clothed. So therefore, even that, he made sure that it was worn in before the nine days began. And there's many, many other anhagas, many other things that he did. So should be an aliyah for his neshama, should be an aliyah for our neshama, as Hashem, as we learn together. And let's go into the first one, keynote number uh, uh, number six, here, right here in the very beginning. So <clears throat> I'm going on the on the verse that he quotes from from Eichav, Al Eila Ani Baichia. On these I will cry. And the question in Chazal, the question that our sages ask us is, what is Yirmiyahu Navi saying? Al Eila, on these I will be Baichia. I will cry. Who is Yirmiyahu crying about? So there's a very famous Gemara, and the Gemara says like this. There was a there was one of the great tzaddikim of that generation, Rabbi Yishma ben Alisha, and he had a son and he had a daughter. They were so beautiful, more beautiful than and than could be could imagine. And they were cap, they were taken captive by two masters. Amru, the master said, Nesiyam Zelazeh. Let's marry these two slaves to each other, this beautiful, handsome man and this beautiful woman over here. And and what will we do? They'll create beautiful children because they're such beautiful kids. And we'll split up the kids among, we'll split up the children amongst ourselves. Whatever they have, a boy, a girl, we'll split it up. Says the Gemara, So what did they do? They took them, they put them into a room. And the boy went into the corner and he began crying. And the girl went into the corner and she began crying. They were crying the entire night. The cave in Sha'al Omar Ashachar. Remember, these going, what did they want? They wanted that this young Jewish boy and girl will be left alone in a room the whole night. It will be dark inside of there. They would feel lonely. They would be bereft of their parents. They'd have nobody but the two of them. And they assume that a Jewish boy and a Jewish girl left alone for a whole night together. What are they going to do? They're not having relations with each other. And the morning when she's pregnant, they'll have to start having children. They'll split up these children amongst themselves. But no, this is Klal Yisrael. These are the Jewish people. These are the holy Jews. So the boy went into the corner and he cried the entire night. How could I go through such a thing? And the girl went into the corner and she cried, how could I go through such a thing? The cave, and they didn't know they were brother and sister. They didn't realize that part of the story yet. They just knew that they were shoved into this room at nighttime. And they didn't talk to each other. The cave in Shalom and Ashachar, in the morning when the sun came up, he they recognized each other. They fell on each other's shoulders. The and they cried out in, in uncontrollable tears. Until... Then the shamas until their souls left them, they died. And on that Yirmiyahu, he laments, On these I cry, My eyes, my eyes, says Yirmiyahu Novi, they are pouring down water and tears. Says of Gamliel Rabbanovich, on these, on these ideas of, the, of Chazal, that Yermio was crying, not for himself. Yermio had a lot to cry about. Of all the Nevi'im that we have in the, in the 49 prophets, Yermio had a very hard life. He was tormented by Klal Yisrael. He went through difficulties. He went through challenges, hatred. They despised him. They wanted to get rid of Yermio. Imagine the guy standing up and they're, they're throwing the tomatoes at him to pelt him, to get him down from where he is. They couldn't stand Yermio. Why? Because Yermio, whenever he came to the Jewish people, and he would open his mouth with nevuah. He would always say one thing. HaKadosh Baruch is not happy with you. You better change your ways. You better do chuv. He's going to bring a korban of bias. I'm warning you. And who wants to hear that? Nobody wants to. They want to hear that, the, that their crypto bite money is going to go up next week. And they want to hear that the recession is going to go away. And they want to hear that the gas price will go down for the 51st week in a row. That's what they want to hear. They don't want to hear, do tshuva, become better, be a better person, be a better Jew. 
So they despised Yirmiyah, had a hard life. He was himself, gullus, this and back. But Yirmiyah didn't cry about himself. Yirmiyah cried about another, the other Yidin in Klal Yisrael. Yirmiyah's pain was not his own internal pain of what he was struggling with. The pain that Yirmiyah Navi had was the pain that he felt for another Yid, for another Jew. And therefore he points out that the godless, the greatness of Yirmiyah Navi was that he was so much in tune with the suffering. He was so much in tune with the pain. He was so understanding of where Klal Yisrael was holding that when he was in the heightened state of Nevoah, what was he thinking about? He was thinking about this poor boy and this poor girl, the brother and the sister that were thrown in to this room together to do a heinous sin. And they cried themselves to death. That's the Kedusha, that's the purity of Klal Yisrael, to recognize what they almost fell into. And Baruch Hashem, they were stopped. So Yirmiyom had a very deep, dear place in his heart. And so if Gamliel writes the following idea, and he says, um, Yirmiyom went through so many, so many sufferings. But because that he felt so much pain, because he went through what he went through, therefore Yomiyah was much more equipped to be able to feel the pain of another person. When HaKadosh Baruch Hu puts us through pain, we have to ask ourselves, why is he putting us through pain? Why do we suffer? Why do we have hardships? Just because HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants to clobber us over the head so that we should, we should feel bad for ourselves? Chalila v'chas, that's not why Hashem does it. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is trying to make you into a more sensitive person who is going to be able to then take that sensitivity and allow other people into your life and other people into your world and you'll be able to feel the pain and the suffering and the hardship that they are going through. When we say that a person should be a noisei ba'oil bechaver, which means we have to be someone that bears the burden of one's friend. If your friend's burden bothers you, it's very hard to bear it. If the person annoys you with all of their complaining and all their fetching and all their problems and all their difficulties, it's very hard to let them inside and to bear the burden together with you. But when you are a person who understands what it means to bear your own burden, when you're a person who's been through your own sufferings and your own travails and your own hardships in life, when you have gone through things that you think that maybe nobody else in the world has ever been through, and it made you into a better and a more sensitive person in different areas of your life. There was once in a, in a uh, camp, in a summer camp, there was, there was, oh no, no, it's a different story. Never mind. There was um, whatever a person will go through in their lives, the reason that HaKadosh Baruch Hu puts you through that is because he wants you to grow for yourself, but he wants you to equip you with the ability of being able to help other people as well. <clears throat> a person has traumatic experiences. A person has disappointments. A person has upsets in their life. A person goes through something that is such a difficult Nisayan, they don't know how in the world they're going to overcome it. But they do. They keep pushing and they overcome and they pass the Nisayan, maybe not with flying colors, but they get to a certain point where they can accept and they can be makabal. That's the person that when he sees somebody else going through the same exact thing, you're the one that's going to go and help them. Yemiyo Navi went through a lot of pain. He went through a lot of suffering in his life. But it all prepared him, says Rav Gamliel Rabbanovich, it prepared him for that, for that ability to be able to carry the burdens of Klal Yisrael upon him and be in tune and to feel the pain of his fellow Jew. Madrega Kolkach Gedoy was such a lofty level that he was on. The Abbas Yisrael is tremendous love of the Jewish people. Shele Gil Yermiel Yermiel reached this extreme level. That's one of the reasons that Hashem chose him to be the, this Novi par excellence 
who was able to guide Klal Yisrael through this godless into the destruction of the first base of Migdash, because he loved them so dearly. He's the one that was picked to fit in the in the in the at the head. I'm Kaddish of this holy nation. He says, You want to help Klal Yisrael? It's only one way. The only way is you got to love them. You have to care about them. You have to see them. But you have to understand them. And somebody that has gone through their own difficulties in life, they can understand other people when they're going through difficulties. So don't be upset with the Rebbein Nishayim when something doesn't go your way. Know that HaKadosh Baruch is doing it for a reason because He is preparing you for your own self, but He's preparing you to be able to help others as well. So on this passage over here, Rechaim Kanievsky says the following idea. It says, On these I will cry. My eyes run down with water. Because a comforter who is going to revive my spirit is far away from me. Ask of Chaim Kanievsky the famous question. How do we know that after so many thousands of years of being in Gauls and being in the exile, how do we know that HaKadosh Baruch didn't forget about us? The Chavetz Chaim couldn't bring Mashiach. Rabbi Akiva couldn't bring Mashiach. The Baba Sali couldn't bring Mashiach. The Chido couldn't bring Mashiach. The Vilna Gaon couldn't bring Mashiach as much as he wanted Mashiach to come. Trust me, he was waiting every single day that Mashiach Sikena should come. So how do we know that after 2,000 years of being in the Gullahs, how can we be sure that HaKadosh Baruch didn't forget about us. Maybe he forgot. Maybe in Mashiach, it's a nice idea. It gives a lot of hope. It's a nice thing to think about. We'll sing a song. We'll dance a little bit about Mashiach. We'll talk about Mashiach every once in a while when we're down and down and out. When we're in the dumps, we'll finish off every drasha with the Mashiach will come. We may you may know. How do you know he's coming? HaKadosh Baruch who seems to have abandoned us and forgot about us. So he answers the following. Chazal, Chazal teach us that there is a gzera min hashemayim, there's a heavenly decree that if a person has passed away, so even though that the loss is very, very strong for the people that he was closest to, eventually the loss of that person is going to be forgotten from their heart. However, because why? Because a person will never mourn over someone for an extended period of time that has already left this world. That's why the laws, even though you have, you have Shiva, you have, the, you have Shiva, you have Shleishim, you have the first year. By the end of the first year, we're not mourning anymore the loss of the person who has gone. We can remember them. We can be, inspire ourselves with their lifetime. But we don't mourn the loss over someone that had passed away already a year ago and beyond. Why? Because... Because that person has gone on to his new world. He has had made his tikkun. He's in Olam Haba. He's in Gan Eden. He's forgotten from our hearts. However, he writes, if a person is still alive, even though they might be lost, we don't know where they are. We can't find them. We don't see them. They're gone from us. Nevertheless, on that, the, the memory of that person or the feelings of that person that itself, it will never leave the person's heart. The person is not going to be forgotten. How do we see this most? We see when Yaakov, when Yosef HaTzadik went down into Mitzrayim. So Yaakov Avinu refused to be consoled and comforted. Why? Because you can only be truly comforted when somebody dies. Then the consolation can come in. But if the person is still alive, even though he's not there in front of you, and Yaakov knew through his Ruach HaKadosh that Yosef was really alive. Therefore, he was unable to be consoled and comforted by his children and anybody else. Says of Chaim Kanievsky, if we're still mourning for the Beis HaMikdash, that means that it has not been truly forgotten from our hearts. And that means that the loss is still evoking the tears that we hope that we're going to reach today. And what does that mean, he writes? That means that the Beis HaMikdash is not really dead, which means that it's not gone permanently from this world. It's just lost. We lost the Beis HaMikdash. We don't have a Beis HaMikdash in the world today. But it's not gone forever. 
which means that HaKadosh Baruch Hu, as he writes over here, even though that the Chorban is so far in the distant past, it indicates that our redemption will soon be at hand. For this emotion demonstrates that the Beis Hamikdash is not gone and it will be returned to us. If we could still sit on the floor 2,000 years later and mourn the loss of the Beis Hamikdash and actually cry, whether you cry or not today, that will be up to you. Whether you cry or not, but that you're here on a Sunday afternoon when LA is doing a lot of other things on a Sunday afternoon, but you're here sitting on the floor and we're trying to get into the moon and we're trying to mourn the loss of the Beis Hamikdash, that means that the Beis Hamikdash is still alive in our midst. It's just that HaKadosh Baruch Hu needs to bring it back to us. So therefore he writes, do not worry for a moment. Do not think that the Beis Hamikdash, that Hashem forgot about us. As long as we still can feel it in our hearts, that means that the Beis Hamikdash is there and it's getting ready to be built, and it's going to happen at any time. So I'll leave you with a story on, on these ideas. The <clears throat> This Maise takes place in the beginning of World War II, and we find that in the, in the city of, Rom of Sered, Romania, so even though that they somehow seem to have dodged a lot of the Nazis and the torment and everything. In 1941, finally the Nazi regime came in and they began to do the Judenrein, which was to clean out the city of all the Jews that were there. And the Romanians themselves, the non-Jews, they were very, very happy to assist the Nazis and help to get rid of all of the Jews that were there. So there was an 11-year-old boy and his name was Beryl. And Beryl was watching as everything was unfolding in front of him. He saw the terrors, he saw the horrors, he saw everything was happening. And they told all the Nazis, told everybody, pack your bags, you get ready to leave, everybody's gonna be leaving and they're going on a hike. And all the families began frantically packing the, their bags. They took whatever they could, their valuables, their gold and their silver and their money. They were sewing it into their clothing as fast as they possibly could. And then they were going, and suddenly as all the Jews are gathering in the middle of town to go on this massive hike, the heavens open up and a storm of the likes they hadn't seen comes pouring down on everybody that's there out there in the center of town. And the Nazis, Nebach, they were upset that they were getting so soaking wet for the Jews over here. So they started getting very, very angry. And they became even, even more they were flying off the handle even more, and any Jew that was stepping out of line, they were, that was it. That was the end of them. And they had the shepherd, the German shepherd dogs were barking and biting and eating, all different things. And the people themselves were standing in the rain. It was freezing. It was pouring. It was impossible to bear. They had their, lug, their clothing and whatever they have over their shoulders, bags that they're trying to take with them. But the Nazis pushed them, and the next thing they know, they're on this hike, they're on this march, maybe a death march, and they have no idea where they're going. So they're walking for hours and hours. It turns into days, and they see nowhere in sight is there an end. They have no idea what is going on. And people are getting old, and they're getting weak, and they're falling by the wayside. And the way that these death marches work, that if you, even if you, you waver, if you slip for a moment and you stop walking, that's it. The Nazi will, will kill you. You're gone. So there's people that are falling, and they're being killed. This young 11-year-old boy, Beryl, is watching all the old men getting weak. And he sees that they can't go on anymore. Now, it stopped raining a long time ago. They're hiking already for days. No food, no drink, no water, no anything, barely any rest. How can you live? You can't live. So he realized he has to do something. He has to try to save the life of these elderly people that are there who can't make it another step. So what does he do? When he sees that nobody's looking, he runs over to a, sw a frozen swamp that's right nearby. And he takes his tzitzis, his talus cotton, and he sticks his tzitzis into the cold, freezing water. And he drenches his tzitzis. And then he runs back to the old men that are lying there, almost ready to give up their lives. And he takes the tzitzis with the water and he squeezes the water into their mouths. And he gives them a morsel, a drop of water, a drop of life that is able to get them going. 
and he keeps going back and forth and he's going around to every single person. He's feeding them, he's nourishing them with the water that he's getting from the swampy area, the frozen swampy area. And he gave life to many, many, many people on that day that survived as a result of the heroic efforts of an 11-year-old boy who felt the pain of another Jew, who saw what he, he wasn't suffering. He's 11 years old. He doesn't have a mother and a father anymore. He doesn't know where his siblings are anymore. He's trekking like everybody else. Take an 11-year-old American and tell him to go on a hike with no food for two minutes. He's going to start complaining to you. Here's an 11-year-old boy who just lost his family. He's going on a hike for days on end. He's not thinking about himself. He's thinking about the other yidin that are there that need his help. And so he brings them <clears throat> back to life. He gives them these droplets. However, as a result of that, imagine it's icy winds. It's freezing cold. He now has frozen tzitzis because he's, he drenched all of his tzitzis into the icy cold waters. The wind is blowing. He's freezing beyond belief. Nevertheless, because he had done so much chesed and he had so many yidin that were there, he didn't feel the ice cold. He didn't feel the frigid air. He felt the warmth of the Yiddish hearts of the Jewish sensitive heart that was able to feel for everybody else. This young boy ended up surviving. And after the war, Beryl made his way over to Eretz Yisrael. And in Eretz Yisrael, he became known as Av Yaakov Yisachar Be'er Rosenbaum, who was in the, the Navarno Rebbe, one of the great Hasidic Rebbe's after the war. And as a Rebbe, he was able to counsel hundreds and not thousands and thousands of Yidin to give them hope, to give them advice, to give them direction, to give them love, to give them warmth. All from the tzitzis and the caring heart that this boy had when he was 11 years old there in the war. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu will put us through suffering. HaKadosh Baruch Hu will put us through situations in our life. He will give us things that we didn't ask for. But he does it all for one reason. It makes us the sensitive hearted person who is going to be able to better understand another Jew. And as Avchaim Kanievsky is saying over here as well, we have to remember through this, through these, through this kinois and through these words in Eich over here, don't ever think for a moment that HaKadosh Baruch forgot about us. Maybe we forgot about Hashem. Maybe we're not doing everything that we could for the Rebbein Nesha'ilam to help bring Mashiach, and Hashem didn't forget. He's waiting any single day to bring. The fact that we can still sit on the floor and mourn that loss is a sign that the Beis Amigdash, or the concept of the Beis Amigdash, is alive. And Be'ez Hashem Yizbarach, as we continue to go through this day of Tisha B'av, we go through the day of understanding the Kino is better and better and better. May we be people that in the eyes of our Kodesh Baruch will find that favor that Hashem says, you didn't forget me, I, you didn't forget about Klai Yisrael, I didn't forget about you and the rest of the Jewish world, and therefore I'll bring Mashiach Zitenu Bimheira Biyameinu. Kina number Vav. Shabbat Shalom. Oh, 
Here in Tehillim in, uh, in Kina Zion, so we find a, a very similar idea in the Psukim, and the ideas behind this Kina. It says in Eicha Kila Yiznach Laoilam Adoinoi. It says, Please do not reject me forever, Hashem. Please do not reject me. Remember, this is really, this is Klal Yisrael, or this is. Yushalayim itself that is speaking to HaKadosh Baruch and is saying, please do not reject me, do not leave me alone. Yushalayim was lying in ruins at this time. The people were on the run, they were leaving. She was going, she's abandoned like an almana, like a, like a widowed woman. She doesn't have a husband anymore. She's go, she is all by herself. Ki yiznach Hashem, please HaKadosh Baruch Hu, do not abandon me forever. And Rav Gamliel writes, Av keshat sarois by Yisurin misgarbi ma'oid. Even when we find a lot of sorrows, a lot of suffering, a lot of pain that become building up on a person, building up on Klal Yisrael. Yesh lanu ledas ki HaKadosh Baruch Hu lo yazai vayisana lo'ilam. We have to know, we have to believe that HaKadosh Baruch Hu does not leave us ever. Ube MS, in truth, we call Pradu Prat in every single detail that we have in our lives. Nitin Leroy says Hashem, a person is able to see the Rebbeinu Shailam. Bechol Azmanim, Bechol Amatsavim, all of the time, in every matzav, every single situation that a person is in, they will be able to see the Rebbeinu Shailam. We have to have the eyes of a Rebbe Akiva, Rebbe Akiva was famously going one night and he was traveling through town. He was looking for lodging and he couldn't find a place to stay. So every door that he knocked on, they said, sorry, we don't take visitors. Sorry, we don't know who you are. Sorry, you don't have your Zell account. We can't, you can't pay us. Sorry, we're not going to have you. So he came on every single door that was locked, closed on his face. He said, Kol diavid rachmona letavavid. I'm guaranteed that whatever HaKadosh Baruch Hu does, it's all for the good. I have nothing to worry about. And we all know the story. That night he went out into the fields. He had with him his candle. He had with him his donkey. He had with him his chicken. And he had with him his, his svarim to be able to learn. In the middle of the night, comes along the wind and blows out the candle. Couldn't learn Torah anymore by the firelight. And he said, no, called the Ovid Rachmana, whatever Hashem does, the Tavavid. Comes along a lion and eats up the donkey and he says, No, who's going to carry my load tomorrow? It's okay. He calls the oven, Rachman of the Tavavid. Comes along a fox and eats up the chicken. He says, What am I going to do now? Who's going to wake me up in the morning? Where are the eggs will I have for breakfast tomorrow? Called the oven, Rachman of the Tavavid. Whatever happens, all the best in Hashem. And sure enough, when he walks back into town the next day, 
And he sees that in the middle of the night, the town was ransacked and pillaged and people were robbed and stolen and killed by the bandits that came to the town. He realized if I would have had a fire when they were coming through the fields, they would have seen me. So Baruch Hashem, the fire was blown out. If I would have had the donkey, it would have been braying in the middle of the night. They would have found me. If I would have had the chicken, they would have, would have cocked a little dude, it would have made noise. They would have caught me. So everything that HaKadosh Baruch Hu does, I call everything. Letavav, it is all for the good. Says this little, <laughs> never ever leaves a person. That means that no matter what matzim, no matter what situation they are in, no matter what we are going through in life, HaKadosh Baruch Hu never abandons us. And that's the message that we have to hear by the Chorban. As we know, the famous Gemara tells us that there were two beautiful Kruvim, the, the, the little angelic boy and girl that were in the, in the Kodesh HaKadoshim, in the Holy of Holies. They were on top of the Aron. They had wings. One looked like a boy. One looked like an innocent little girl. And the Gemara and Baba Basra tells us that at some times they were facing each other and sometimes they were facing away from each other. So the Gemara asked, so which was it? Were they together, facing or not facing? The Bizman Shek, Yisrael, Yisim, Ritzan, Yisham, At the time that Kla Yisrael did the will of their master, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, so they would be looking at each other. The male one is like Hashem. The little female one is Kla Yisrael. We're looking with love at each other. But Bizman Shaloi Shaloi at the time that we don't do the will of Hashem, so then this one looks that way and this one looks the other way, they can't look at each other. So the Gemara says, what did it look like in the Kodesh HaKadoshim when they were going into the Golas, when they were going into the exile, when the Beis Hamidosh was being destroyed? What did it look like then? The Goyim walk in and they see the Kodesh HaGadosh and the Holy of Holies. They open it up and they want to laugh and see that these two crew must be flying away from each other. But it was just the opposite. They look inside the Holy of Holies and they see the crew are in a loving embrace. A loving embrace at the moment that we are destroyed and going into the Golas, they're hugging each other. Because as the Mephoshim point out, that's the message that HaKadosh Baruch is leaving over to us. You're going to go into Golis. You're going to have challenges. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be hard. Be confusing what happens around you. But I'm hugging you and I'm loving you and I am with you every single step of the way. And I'm never going to let go. Just don't let go of me, says HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And therefore it says in the Pasuk over here, Never leave us alone. Hashem is the Father of mercy. It's no coincidence that this month is called Chodesh Av. Why Av? Olive Bays, it's the Av, it's the Father. This is the month. The month of destruction. The month of exile. The month of Klal Yusel being on the run, the month of all the tragedies in the world that ever have been happening in this month, it's the month that is called the of the Father. Why is this month called the Father? This should, month should be called, I don't know, destruction, Chorban. Why is it called the Father? Because the Avarachaman, our Father of, of mercy, our Father in heaven, our Father is watching over us. He's telling us that even when you are suffering with a Father, always has to be nice to his kids. The kid can never do anything wrong. That's that We know that you raise a spoiled brat that way. If a kid can get away with bloody murder every single time and get whatever he wants and do whatever he wants and go wherever he wants and the money keeps coming and everything, how does that kid grow up? He's a rotten, spoiled brat who will never take responsibility for himself. He'll never own up to his mistakes. He'll do things that will defy imagination. So a good parent who loves his children, when he sees them stepping out of line, he has to put them back into line. He has to give them a little bit of rebuke. He has to give them a consequence. He has to hold on to them. He has to, not that we say to Pach, we, this is the generation that the kids, they have like some app on their phone called parent abuse. You know, if a, if a parent even raises their voice, that's it, the police at the door two seconds later. Did you yell at your son? Yeah, I did. You know what he did? No. So you're not allowed to anymore. So we're not talking about that. But we're talking about teaching 
our children and teaching ourselves to take responsibility for our actions. Says, says, says HaKadosh Baruch Hu, this month is called Av. It's called the Father, because I'm the Father of mercy. A merciful father doesn't always do to the child what the child wants to, wants to hear. He doesn't always treat the child carte blanche, go ahead and do whatever you want. A merciful parent is the one that shows real love to the child, and therefore he will reprimand him, and he will advise him, and he will redirect him when it's necessary. So to HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, this is the month where there was so much destruction, so many hardships, so many hard times, but you should know, like they prove and embrace each other, I'm the Avarachim, and I'm the Father of Mercy. I'm taking care of you. And he says, which is an important lesson for us to keep in mind. Why do the Jewish people suffer? Why do we suffer? There's never been a nation in the history of the world that has suffered as much as we have. I think you can have any scientist, any historian take a look at what we've gone through and what other nations have gone through. First of all, they're not around anymore. Any nation that was destroyed, any nation that suffered, they don't exist anymore in this world. They exist in, you know, the Greeks are, are left in <coughs> yogurt and a salad. And the, the Romans, you know, they over there in USC during the football games. There's nothing less than the other, of the other nations. Klal Yisrael has, has, has been able to travel from continent to continent, from country to country, from nation to nation, and Klal Yisrael is still around. And we take a beating everywhere that we go, and now it's just beginning in America, Chas Chalila. Anybody who watches the news sees what's going on here in L.A., it's still, you know, we're pretty PC over here in L.A., so God forbid anybody should say that they're anti-Semitic. But in New York, they're not PC. So New York anti-Semitism is racing out of control right now. In Europe, they're not politically, politically correct. So anti-Semitism is out of, out the roof right now. And eventually in Los Angeles, because that's the, the rule of PC is that you're only not you're only allowed to be PC about the things that bother you. But anything that doesn't bother you, so then you don't be PC about. So therefore, when it gets to the point where they hate the Jews and they're ready to express their hatred of the Jews, it'll happen here also. In Berkeley, California, they'll start beating the Jews. And in California, they'll start telling us that it's all our fault that the gas prices it wasn't Putin. It's because Putin and I used to get stolen from the Jewish people on Shabbos. That's why the gas prices went down, because of the Jewish people. It's all Narish guy. Says, but why does really, why does really HaKadosh Baruch Hu suffering to cloud you? So why? He brings it for one reason. And this is the Yisrael that we speak about every single year on Tisha because if we don't understand this, how are we ever going to change and grow? And the reason is because of gormim. Our sins bring about the suffering and the pain that we will go through. This we know the famous words of Rabbi Vigda Miller Zatzal when he was watching history unfold in front of his eyes he had been in Slobodka before World War II broke out. He came to America just in time. Then he watched from American soil, he watched the war take place. He watched Nazi Germany destroy six million of the lives of Klau Yisrael. And everybody was asking after the war, how could it be? Why would Hashem do? What did, it, what, what, what did we do? What's going on? And Ravik Miller for several years remained quiet. Because he didn't want to say anything. He felt that the wounds were so fresh and the pain was so deep. People's lives had been destroyed. They were trying to rebuild. He kept quiet. He didn't say a word. And suddenly, several years after the war, he gave his first shear publicly about why he felt that the Holocaust happened. And he said, I'm not a Navi. I'm not a prophet. I'm not the son of a prophet. I can't tell you. I have Navu to tell you, but I can just be a, a studier of history. And I can use the words of the Torah and Chazal to put everything in the perspective. And he showed that for 500 years. It's a fascinating book, A Divine Madness. He showed that for 500 years, Klal Yisrael was working towards the Holocaust of Islam. 
And HaKadosh Baruch continued to give them warnings all along the way to show them you have to stop doing what you're doing. The assimilation is getting out of control. The immorality is going down the drain. The Jewish people are getting fascinated by culture and art and all the silliness of this world. You're forgetting what it means to be a Jew. And he showed how there were pogroms and there were, there were, there were different things happening all the time that was here to come and wake the Jewish people up, but we never woke up until it got to the point where all of the terrible, terrible, terrible foreboding prophecies in the Torah and Chazal, they started coming true. And he said, why? Because of the Avonah, because of the sins of our nation. Now, whether a person does the sin themselves in this lifetime, or whether a person made mistakes in a previous lifetime, and therefore they have to go through some restitution over here in this world, it doesn't really matter. The point is, is that any time that there is things that are befalling a person, there are tikkunim, there are corrections that need to take place in the neshama, in the life of that person in order to bring them to a much greater place, as he writes. It's all here to cleanse and to purify and to make a person much better. When a person will accept the punishments that Hashem is sending them. And he asked HaKadosh Baruch Hu, please, and bring more mercy upon me. Then you will see, in fact, that from the pain, from the difficulty, from the hardship, that we're macabre, we accept it upon ourselves. We realize that Godish Baruch Hu wants me to become a greater person and a cleaner spiritual person as a result. Then you should know that HaKadosh Baruch Hu will listen and he will see what you are doing and he'll bring the brach, he'll bring the goodness, he'll bring the chesed. If only everybody would think like this. To be able to handle the suffering that they are going through. Yes, Soroisov in their pain. The Yodan and Mona know for certain Kisoifai at the end. She Yerucham Mi'eis Hashem HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to have mercy and compassion and pity on you. It might take months. It might take years. It might take decades to get there. But the more that HaKadosh Baruch Hu sees that we are people that are willing to be makabal, to accept about ourselves that which Hashem puts us through because He's doing it for a reason. He knows better than we know what's for ourselves. He understands the deepest parts of your neshama, the deepest parts of the mission of why it is that we came to this world, what Hashem wants us to accomplish. He knows what you need to go through. He made this plan already before you came to this world. While you were standing under the chuppah and you and your wife were looking at each other and you were dreaming of the most amazing, beautiful life, Hashem was determining already the trajectory of where you're going to go, of every pain and every suffering and every difficulty you'll go through for a reason. Because Hashem says, that's the only way that I'm going to be able to make you the greatest person in the world. You can't do it on your own. You need some help. Person goes to the gym. We said over this muscle many times. You want to become strong. You can't lift puny amounts of weight. It doesn't work like that. You'll be nothing in the world of muscles. You'll just be a regular guy that just pumps nothing. But if a person gets a trainer, and the trainer sees the physique, and they see the potential, they see the muscles, the body mass, the weight, everything, they can begin to design the program that is best for this particular person to be able to run. Does everybody run marathons? Anyway, not everybody runs marathons, but probably more people could run marathons if they would know the kind that they have inside of themselves. They would just realize, I train, I'll eat right, I'll sleep right, I'll take my vitamins, my minerals, I'll, I'll train on the mountain ranges, I'll train over here in the cold, in the hot. You'll find with inside of yourself the stamina that you never knew existed. Most of us, which means really everybody in the world, from all of history, doesn't understand the stamina and the potential and the inner strength that they have. 
unless HaKadosh Baruch Hu will bring a challenge in your life that will force you to confront yourself in the mirror to see what you're really all about. And once Hashem puts you in that place and He puts you into that, that moment in your life where push comes to shove, you have two choices. It's either, it's either go through it or just bail out on everything. Either I'm going to take the challenge to heart or I'm just going to crumble. Now, that's why people fail the Nisyonis, right? Hashem would never, ever give a person a challenge that they can't overcome. We believe that, right? Hashem knows us. He would never, ever give us a challenge that, he can, that we cannot overcome. So then how can we fail our tests? If Hashem would never give me a challenge I can't overcome, because Hashem knows what's the essence of inside of me, HaKadosh Baruch Hu knows what I'm capable of accomplishing. He knows what's inside, all the potential that is there. So then how come it is, time and time again, I get challenged by HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and I fail the test? Hashem, you would never give me anything that I can never overcome. And the answer is simple, the way that we're explaining. Hashem can just take us to the water, but He can't get the horse to drink. He can bring us to the moment where we will just be honest with ourselves, we'll change and we'll transform ourselves. But He cannot be the one that is going to do that to us. That has to come from you. That has to come from us. We have to look inside of ourselves and find a deep desire inside that says, I want to change. I want to become a person of more amuna. I want to become a person of more bitachin. I want to love Torah and mitzvahs. I want to be a nice husband, a nice wife. I want to be a good parent. I want to be a better child and do more kibbutz of aim. I want to. Hashem said, you want to? Don't worry, I'll give you plenty of opportunities to do such a thing. But it has to get in there. If a person would just realize this, what he's saying over here, yeido <clears throat> nemona. At the end of the day, you're going to have mercy from HaKadosh Baruch One of the people that I've been privileged to get close to over the last several years, I already know him for maybe more than 25 years, but the more recent, more recent present became very close is a man by the name of Shimon Russell. He was here for a Shabbos not long ago. He's one of the masters of Chinuch HaBanim in our generation. And his specialty is dealing with the challenged crisis world that we live in today of children that are struggling, struggling to understand themselves, struggling to find their way in Yiddishkeit, struggling to find their way in a relationship between themselves and Hashem and their families and everything. Children in crisis, kids, kids that are in pain, kids that are off the derech, that are not on the derech exactly the way that, that they could be. So he told me a fascinating thing. He was a regular family in Lakewood, New Jersey, that goes, I already asked him permission if I could tell stories. He said, any, any story that I tell you, he said, you can tell that story in my name, no problem. He goes back about 25, maybe a little bit more than 25 years ago, he was in Lakewood, New Jersey. Lakewood, for anybody who knows, it's if you can't live in Eretz Israel, so the next religious place in the world is Lakewood, New Jersey. And 25 years ago, there was no such thing as kids going off the derech in the droves the way that they are today. It didn't exist. It was a normal place. Everybody was more or less, you're holding my frum kite. So his oldest daughter one day surprises them and they realize that she's not like so enthusiastic about her Judaism. She's not so excited to go to school, not so excited about davening, about keeping kosher, about keeping Shabbos. And before he knows it, he and his wife are going through a nightmare. His oldest daughter goes off the derech of Yiddishkeit. 25 years ago, this was unheard of in Lakewood, New Jersey. But it didn't stop over there. Then they have a, their next child. The next child sees the great example of the older sister. And they start looking at themselves and the world and what they can have. And then the next one goes off. And then the next one goes off. And now he has three kids in Lakewood, New Jersey, going off the derech, doing unusual things for the neighborhood. People are telling him, you know, you know what's going on over here? Say, I know what's going on. How can you let such a thing happen? How can you let such a thing you, you, have a, you have control? 
as everybody knows, we have no control over our children. You cannot control these things not to let them happen. You could try, but our Kodesh Baruch Hu runs the world. At the end of the day, he was living in Lakeland, New Jersey. He was a prominent therapist, the most prominent therapist in all of Lakewood. He had hundreds of people that were coming to him for advice and counseling and therapy. Him and his wife were well-respected members of the community, had built shuls, had built the community, had done many things. Within a short amount of time, six of his eight children all went off the derech. Six out of eight. The, the Rabbanim were coming down on him. The Roshivas were coming down on him. The friends didn't want to speak to him. They all told him, you don't know what you're doing. What are you doing? Huh? He went through a Gehenna. He went through a life of H-E-L-L -L that nobody should ever understand or ever know. And he suffered. He and his wife, they suffered. They had nobody to talk to. Nobody understood them. Nothing. But together, he and his wife, they were a very close couple, Baruch Hashem. And they had moments of true introspection and honesty and sincerity. And they worked together to develop a whole mahalach, a whole way in which they're going to raise their children who have departed from the derech of Torah and mitzvahs in order to do their best to bring them back to some place where they would be comfortable in the pathway of Yiddishkeit. One of the famous statements that is out there today is, that if the derech, if the pathway of Yiddishkeit would not be so narrow, there would be much more room for everybody to be on the derech today. But because it became such a narrow world, and this is the way that it is, and this is the way it is, and this is the way that it is, so any kid that's a little bit out of the box, anybody that's a little, a little thinks a little bit more than the average kid, he sees, well, I don't fit in here, and I don't fit in here, and I don't fit in here, so I'll just go find something else that's outside the pathways. Anyway, to make a long story short, it's been a 25-year growing experience for Rabbi Russell and his wife. In the interim, Bliainara, five of his children all came back to Yiddishkeit. Each one in their own way. Not saying that everybody's well, black and white, but you don't have to say until you have to be black and white. So you to keep Shabbos, keep kosher. You have to not speak Lush and Hara. You should put out the in every day. Where did it say Moshe Benin wore a black hat? He wore a strimal? Doesn't say that. Maybe in the picture books it says that Moshe Benin had a strimal. Yeah? But doesn't say that. It says the mitzvahs in the Torah. A Jew's supposed to keep the mitzvahs. That was, that's what we're supposed to do. So five out of the six came back, and the sixth one, that's Hashem, they're still working with, with tremendous love and understanding. As a result of everything that he and his wife went through, so they developed a whole outlook and a whole approach to the Chinuch. And today, he has become a world-renowned mechanic who has literally assisted and aided and directed and guided tens of thousands of parents that are struggling and going through the same difficulties of trying to raise their children in the crazy world that we live in today. And he told me, if HaKadosh Baruch Hu would not have done what he did to me, is that I would have lived out my life, simple guy in Lakewood, New Jersey, good therapist, I would have helped a lot of people do whatever they were going through, and that would have been it. Nobody would have known about Shimon Russell. That would have been my life, the little corner over there in Lakewood. He says, but the Rebbeinah Sha'ilam has a plan for every single one of us. And everybody has a mission that they must go on. And he said he sees for himself and he and his wife that the mission that they had to go on was we'll go through our suffering for the sake of the benefit of Klal Yisrael. And he said, therefore, I have hundreds of thousands of people that watch my shiurim, that watch my lectures. He has emails coming in all day long. He has messages flying on his phone all day long. He doesn't have, he doesn't have time to breathe. But he and his wife, after everything they went through, as you'll see them, if you always see them together, they are two of the happiest most relaxed, kind, compassionate, understanding people that you will ever meet. And his wife told me that she never ever dreamed that she would have had to go through everything she went through in raising her children. She never dreamed in a million years. She said, but after the fact, she wouldn't trade it in for anything. Because the person that she has become 
as a result of the challenges that HaKadosh Baruch Hu put her through in life, is a person that she knows she would never, ever have reached had she not been pushed by the Rebbein HaShayim. So we <clears throat> are a nation of people that we're not asking to be pushed. We're not asking for the challenges. We're not asking for the Nisyanos, but we know they're going to come. And if we will only embrace them in our lives to recognize that this particular challenge is going to be the thing that makes us who we are, that allows us to fulfill our mission in this world, that will give us the chain, the favor in the eyes of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And not only can we help ourselves, but we will help others around us as well. So then, at the end, you should be guaranteed that HaKadosh Baruch will have compassion and mercy on all of us. Be'ez Hashem. Kine Zayin, number seven. I'm skipping the next couple of kids. They're very much uh, along the same ideas that we discussed before. But just to keep in mind, that means what we're discussing, that means that Khorban, destruction, 
there's actually an opportunity for a person to build. You know, they just they just destroyed a house on this street over here. They knocked it down to the ground. So on one hand, you look at it, it's terrible. They took a house, it was there, it was livable, people were there. They knocked the house down. But why, why did they knock the house down? They knocked it down because they want to build something better and bigger and nicer and stronger and sturdier in, in that place. So whenever there is korban, whenever there's destruction, whenever there's HaKadosh Baruch Hu breaking a person down, he's doing it for a reason. Because he wants that person to become better and stronger and more fortified and more infused with their amunah. So holding over here in, in uh, Kina number Yud, number 10, and one of the verses that it brings down from, from Eicha is the, is the following verse. It's uh, number 116, I believe, in Eicha. And it, it, says, it says like, uh, number 118, it says like this in Eicha. Uh-uh. Per, um, I'm sorry. All right, okay. Yeah. It says over here, it says the following. Tzadiku Hashem. Hashem is a, is a tzadik, he is righteous. Ki piu marisi, his, he, I, because I disobeyed what he said. Shimuna kola amim, all of the nations should listen to me. they should see my pain and my suffering. my virgins and my the young men they're going over, they're going in captivity. So Reb Chaim Kanievsky over here says the following idea: If you look in the way that the pasuk is written, it says kol amim, all of the nations. But it should really be written, kol ha'amim, all of the nations. So whenever, Rav Chaim Kanievsky was famous for this, that whenever you're missing a letter, there must be a very deep reason why it is that that, that particular letter is missing from the word. Remember, it says that all of you people should listen to me, or all of you people, as we'll see, you should have mercy and, and pity on me. But instead of saying it in the right grammar of kol ha'amim, all of the people, it says, call Amim all, all people. Now, why does it leave out the hey? So he says the following that Yemiyo Novi was saying like this Listen, all of you people. He's giving a call to all the other nations that they should join us to sympathize with our pain and they should help us. That's what we want. We should look. The, the world should look at a nation that's going through genocide, they should look at a nation that's going through total destruction. The Goyim have come in and destroyed our base of Migdash, and they should have they should have pity on us. However, many of the other nations ended up rejoicing when we had the downfall. When we were suffering, they were celebrating. When we were uh, when we were getting damaged, they were celebrating in the streets. So what does that mean? He says like this: the fact that they were rejoicing and they were celebrating. It helped to bring about the ultimate redemption for Klal Yisrael. Why? Because there's a nevuah by Micha. And it says, Al nefalti kamti. So Micha says to my enemies should not rejoice over my downfall because even though that I fell, kamti, I'm going to get up. Klal Yisrael says, even though that I fall, I'm going to get up. So if you're rejoicing from the fact that I fell, that means that you acknowledge that the first part of the Pasuk has come true. If I will fall, says the verse, I will eventually get up. If you are happy that I have fallen, guess what's going to happen then? You've acknowledged my falling. You've acknowledged my korban. You've acknowledged my pain and my suffering. You know what's going to happen then? Kamti, I'm going to get up. And therefore it says in the Pasuk over here, <clears throat> Kol ha'amim is missing the hey. We're saying everybody should come and they should acknowledge us and they should they should sympathize with us. It's coming to show that they that ha, the nations of the world not only do they not empathize with us, 
but rather they celebrated and they rejoiced and they were happy that we went through the suffering that we did. So from here you see a fascinating thing. And this is along the lines of what we were saying before. And this is the hope that every single Jew has to have in their life. And that is that no matter how bad the nefila, how bad the falling is, no matter how much a person goes from the, how, how much the nation of Klal Yisrael is wrecked and ravaged and going from place to place, a Jew is never ever allowed to give up one ounce of hope that things could get better than how they are today and right now. And that's what the Pasuk is saying. Since that I fell, that means that I'm going to get up. We call it in, we call it in, in the language of Chazal and the Bali Musa, there's something called <clears throat> a Yerida Litzarech Aliyah or a Nefila Litzarech Aliyah. I will fall in order to get up and to go higher. When you climb a ladder, you don't just hold on by your hands and pull yourself up. You put pressure down on the rung that's beneath you and then that sends you up to the next rung. The only way to climb the ladder is if you are pushing down and that allows you to go up. Sometimes in my life I will have to go down because by going down means that I will eventually be able to come back up. <clears throat> and this is the concept of of ancient Jewish that a person can never despair, they can never give up, because even if in fact we will find ourselves on the down, we will find ourselves struggling and having hard times, a person has to realize and they have to believe and they have to trust in HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That, that is coming in only to prepare me for the next rung in my life, the next stage in my life, the next growth that it is that I'm going to make. And this is really the famous Maisa with Rabbi Akiva. We know at the end of Makkah, the Gemara tells us that it was after the Chorban Abayas, the destruction of the Temple, and Rabbi Akiva was walking with the other sages into Yerushalayim, and they see a fox running out of the Kodesh HaKadoshim, the Beis HaMikdash was destroyed, and there's a fox running out of the Holy of Holies. And all of the sages there, they begin crying. And Rabbi Akiva, Mitzachik, Rabbi Akiva begins to laugh. And they said to Rabbi Akiva, why are you laughing? And he said, why are you crying? And they said, because that place where it says that even a czar, even a stranger is not allowed to enter in there. In the Holy of Holies, only the kind God of An Yom Kippur is allowed to go into the Holy of Holies. No foreigner. No non kohen gadol, not on not on Yom Kippur, cannot go in there. And we look and we see foxes running out of there. How can we not cry? So Rabbi Akiva said, for the same reason that you're crying, that's exactly why I'm laughing, because the Torah tells us that there will be a destruction of the base of Mikdash, but we also know that there's going to be a rebuilding of the base of Mikdash. And Rabbi Akiva tells him, until I saw that it was destroyed. I never believed there would be a Mashiach that's going to come. But now that I see that HaKadosh Baruch Hu destroyed the base of Mikdash, now I know that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to bring Mashiach to the kingdom. When it will be, how soon, how close to this time, I don't know, but I know that it's going to come. So for the same reason that you're laughing, that's, for the same reason that you're crying, <clears throat> that's exactly why I'm laughing. Rabbi Kip was a man who lived in a world, he lived in a world of Never despair what is going on in your life around you because it's all perspective how you see things. It can always be worse and it will always become better. person has to remember that. As bad as things are in life, it could always be a thousand times worse than it is right now. But one thing you have to keep in mind, it will always get better. Maybe not today, maybe not next week, maybe it'll take a few years, but it will always get better. Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, we fall to go up. We press down on the rung of the ladder so we can go up to the next rung of the ladder. I saw a beautiful pshant this year. <clears throat> Once that we're talking, Rabbi Nachman Torah of Ein Shum Yush, that you can never despair. I saw a beautiful pshant, the, the, the Mishnah, in Pirkei Avos says that there are Sar Nisim, there were ten miracles that took place in the base of Migdash. 
And Klal Yisrael, whenever they wanted some chizuk, they wanted to get inspired in the world of Amuni, in the world of Shechin, in the world of the Rebbein and they would walk inside the Beis Hamikdash, they would see the miracles open in front of their face, and they would be mechazik themselves in Amuna. <clears throat> and the, the Mishnah goes through all of the different nisim v'niflois, the miracles that Hashem made. Rabbi Nachman learned, and they're all, they're all things, like uh, there never was a fly in the Beis HaTabachim, where they, where they, where they would shech so many animals. There were korbanas being brought every single day. You know when you go to the butcher and it has that smell? That's called dead meat. Could you imagine being in a could could you imagine being in a base of Migdash outside, no air conditioning, hot day in Yushalay Mira Kodesh, Hamsin, the shechting animals, there's blood dripping everywhere, there's guts all over the place, and not one single fly ever came and landed on a piece of meat. Say to me, it's a miracle. Go, next time you go on your, your barbecue to the park over there, you'll see what a miracle it really is. It says that there was a pillar of smoke, and there were days where it was very windy outside. The pillar of smoke never moved. It stayed straight exactly the way that it was. So one of the miracles which took place was the following. When they were standing in the base of Medes, they would come, the Chagim, Sukkis, Pesach, Shavuos, all of Klal Yisrael coming together. When they were standing, there were so many people in the base of Medesh, they were tzvufim, they're like sardines, they were stuck together like this, <clears throat> there was no place to move. However, umishnachavim, there came times during the davening where they had to prostrate themselves. How could it be that if everybody shoved together like this, how could everybody prostrate themselves? It's impossible. However, Hashem made an ace. When they would prostrate themselves, suddenly there was all the space in the world to spread out exactly the way that they wanted to. So it was a miracle. In the world of space and matter, it's impossible that you, if you're like this, that you can suddenly have all the space. But Hashem made a nice. So Rabbi Nachman of Breslov says over here that don't, that of course we take it literally as well, but he says there's also a very deep message in here. <clears throat> and he says that when a person in life is going through struggles and they're going through challenges and the world sometimes feels like it is caving in on top of them, we feel very tzvufim, we feel very restricted, we feel very crushed, can't even breathe sometimes, we can't even think properly sometimes. It's so difficult to go through, we're like constrained like this. He says, but if a person will then just let go and they will express themselves to the Rebbein Shalom, and they will begin to pour out their heart to Hashem and they will ask HaKadosh Baruch for help and they will say HaKadosh Baruch I believe in you that you are the one that is going to bring me the salvation, you'll bring me the goodness, you'll bring me out of this situation that I'm in. Suddenly there's Rav Chos, there is space, your head opens up again, your heart opens up again, you can start davening again, you can start thinking again. Suddenly, you have what we would call menuches hanefesh, you have peace of mind. When a person is in a difficult time, the last thing they have is what's called menuches hanefesh, they just, their mind is like this. When a person realizes that HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you're in charge, you run the world, like Rabbi Akiva, the same exact reason that everybody was crying bitter tears. Rabbi Akiva was laughing. Because Rabbi Akiva lived in a world of rafchus. He lived in a world of space and of expanse. He wasn't trapped inside of his thoughts. He wasn't trapped in his brain. He wasn't trapped in his Dalit Amas and the four cubits of where he lived and what he was going through. He lived in a higher reality. That's the reality of rafchus of space and tranquility and seeing that a person in their life never has a reason to give up hope. Till the last minutes in the gas chamber, the Yidin were crying out, Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. Why? You're dying now. Why are you crying out? Because to the last single minute in a person's life, they do one thing, they attest their mood and their faith in the Rebbe Nishoyim. Because it's never over till you're out of this world. So as long as a person is alive, as long as they're here, as long as they have their wits about them, 
and they know that they're a Jew, and they know that HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Rachman, he loves them, then a person always has a chance to shift things and to change things and to lift themselves up in life. So there's a beautiful Maisa with Chaim Kanievsky himself. <coughs> there was a... <coughs> Um, yeah, somewhere there's a beautiful license. Oh, here it is. <clears throat> there was a couple in Eretz Yisrael by the name of Maishi and Libby. And they were married for 10 years already, and they were not blessed with any children. Rahman al Islam. And they, of course, did everything that they could have possibly done to try to arouse the Rachamei Hashem, the mercy from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, to bring them children. They went, they gave stanka, they even paid tuition for another child going through school. It should be a schus, a merit for them that they should have their own children to send to school. They went to the Gedolim, they went to all of the great leaders of the generation, they received brachas. They went to the Kibbeit Sadiq into the graves of the righteous men of previous generations and they davened. And after 10 years of lots and lots of prayer and mitzvahs and pain, they were still childless. And they went to one specialist, of course, after another. They went through treatments. They went through many, many different things. And at the end, the doctor said, we're sorry. There's nothing that we can do for you. We don't see how you're going to have children. So one day, Maishi, the husband, travels to B'nai Brak. And he decides that he's going to get a bracha from the Sar HaToyer, from the master of the Torah itself, Rav Chaim Kanievsky, Zeich HaTzadik Livracha. And anybody that's ever been there before, they know how it works, the long lines, and you have to wait sometimes for a very long amount of time. And he waits his time, and he finally gets in to the private chambers of Rav Chaim Kanievsky, and he begins to unleash his burden on Rav Chaim Kanievsky, pouring out his heart, crying tears, telling him from beginning till end how long it's been, how it was. They went to this doctor and that doctor, this treatment, that treatment. They went to this tzaddik and that tzaddik and everything. And here they are 10 years later, they don't have any children. And Rav Chaim Kanievsky is listening. And he was waiting for Rav Chaim to give him a great, gigantic bracha afterwards. Because he would feel his pain, he would empathize with him, and he would give him a blessing that would give him hope that they're going to have children. <clears throat> when the man finishes his tears, and he finishes telling his story, Avchaim Kanievsky looks at him and says, No, what should I tell you? Imatzliach. Should be successful. And the man's looking at him. And where's the bracha? Where's the big bracha I came for? And it was clear that that was the end of the conversation. And the man got up shattered. Totally shattered. Do you know what it means to wait in the line in B'nai Brak with about 300 people and it's 100 degrees with 100% humidity? That's enough to be shattered that you didn't get your bracha. But to go there and then pour out your heart, tell over all your troubles, wail to the God door, and then just say, Be matzliach? I need a bracha for children. <clears throat> so he walks out devastated. And as he walks out of Rav Chaim Kanievsky's house, anybody that's been there, they can picture, right across from the house is something called the Letterman Shul. The Shul that Rav Chaim Davin's at, where his father, the disciple Davin at. And he walks over to the shul, and he walks inside, and the shul is totally empty. The lights are off. And the man walks over to the Aron Kodesh, and he puts his head right to the Aron Kodesh, and he begins crying. And he says, It's just me and you right now. He says, you know and I know. There's nothing that has helped me in the last 10 years of my life to have a child, and that's all that my wife and I want. And I'm asking you, Rebbein Shalom, between you and I, I'm asking you for the bracha, I'm asking you for the help, I'm asking you for the child. 
and he stood there with his head in the Aron Kodesh, and he just cried and cried and cried and cried to the Rebbeinu Shalom, please, Hashem, give me a child, it's up to you. And when he finished all of his tefillah, all of his davening, and all of his tears, he left the shul, and he went home. And nine months later, they had their first child their first of nine children. Rav Chaim Kanievsky was telling this man, what do you want from me? I'm a, I'm a miracle maker? I'm a magician? If HaKadosh Baruch Hu has put you through the tzara in your life, if HaKadosh Baruch Hu sent you to be the person that doesn't have the child for 10 years, if HaKadosh Baruch Hu put you in a situation that other people might not be in and he's putting you into that and he's saw in that challenge in your life, it's because HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants something from you, not from me, from you. And the man took the message to heart. And he went to the shul when nobody was watching and nobody was listening and he had a private moment between him and the Rebbein Nishayim and he poured out his heart like he never poured out before. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu listened to every word he said times nine. Nine children after not having children. I had a, I had a harusa in yeshiva. His parents were Balei Tshuva. When his parents were not from, they got married not from. And they wanted to have, start a Jewish family. No children. They went to this doctor, that doctor, this one, that one. No children, no children. The doctor said, you can't have children. You don't understand how your bodies work. You can't have children. They go to like the last expert doctor. And they are told once again, with the door slammed in their face, what can we tell you? You'll never have a child. They're not religious at the time. They're walking down the street. The mother sees, she looks up, she sees a shul. She hadn't been in the shul. Who knows that she was a kid on nine holidays. She sees the shul. She walks inside. She doesn't know what day of the week it is. It's some kind of holiday. The shul was packed. She walks in and she feels the kedusha that's inside of there. She sees the people davening the kavana. She sees that there's something that's real there. She cries. She stays in the shul for a while. Her husband's waiting outside. She walks out. She says, okay. We're becoming religious. He said, religious? What is that? She said, we're becoming religious. What I saw in there, that's the MS. She said, okay, fine. So, you know, you will, well, no, no. She says, we're becoming religious today. And her and her husband became religious Jews on that day. And my Russo, from the parents that could not have children, was one of the seven children that they had after they became from Yiddin. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, if I send something your way, it's all because I want to make you a better person who's going to be closer to me. And one of the ways that we get closer is we pour out our hearts to the Rebbe Yishayla. We daven and we cry and we ask HaKadosh Baruch Hu for help. You're going to pass it off to Chaim Kanievsky? It's not his Nisayin. You're going to pass it off to that one? It's not their Nisayin. It's to you because from you will become the greatness that you yourself are going to be able to actualize. We should be Zaychem Yerz Hashem that we should recognize that whatever HaKadosh Baruch Hu sends our way, it's not the reason to cry. It's the reason to laugh. Because when Hashem sends something our way, He's saying to you, I trust in you, I believe in you, I support you. I'm behind you 100% of the way. And I know that if you will just see what you could accomplish, you will become the greatest person that you could possibly be. Kina number you. 10. Give us a
<clears throat> the next kina, Yud Aleph, is a, a very famous kina, which we've gone through in depth in previous years. This is about Yoshio Melech. He was a king who led a renaissance of Torah and of mitzvahs. He was probably the original, uh, the original Eishet Torah and Or Sameach. He saw that the, the state of Klal Yisrael at that time was very, very shvach. They were very weak in their commitment to Yiddishkeit. There were a lot of avarias that were going around in the kingdom in Yerushalayim. And uh, although Yoshio was somewhat of an ignoramus himself, he dis- fell upon and discovered a Sefer Torah in the base of Migdash, and he began looking into it and reading the words that were there, and he realized that HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants so much more from a Jew than just to be complacent and just to be regular, to be like anybody else in the world. HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants that a Jew is going to be a person who abides and lives a life of Torah and the life of mitzvahs because in there they will find all of the bracha, they will find all the goodness, they will find out what life is really all about. And so he went on a renaissance campaign to revitalize and to restore the Karen Torah, the crown of Torah, the Klal Yisrael. And he was extremely successful in all that he did, but he had those that were against him, and in the end, he ended up making what seemed to be a mistake in, in decision-making, and he ended up getting killed. And Yemio is, is kaining, he laments over the loss of this great and this mighty king, Yoshio. So it says over here, it says, It says in Eicha, it says, Eicha Yuam Zav. It says, All of the gold has been dimmed. It's talking about Yushalayim. Yishna Kesem Atoiv. The finest gold has changed. Tishtachenu Avne Kodesh Baroish Koil. And all of the sacred stones, they are scattered on, they are scattered at the head of every street corner. So Chaim Kanievsky points out on this verse the following idea. And he says, what does it mean that the finest of all gold, the Yuam Zahab, what does it mean that it has been changed? It means that the Jews at that time of the destruction, they were not treating the base on Migdash and all of its golden vessels appropriately, but rather they misused them. They misused them and they were not observing the laws of the Korbanos in the right way. And by misusing the gold and by mis calculating and understanding what it was, what the Kedusha of the Beis HaMikdash was all about. So by not recognizing who we really are and what we have and what our nation is, is about, that itself brings about a chor, brings about the destruction. This is the exact opposite of what Yoshio HaMelech ended up going through. He recognized that the Kayach HaTorah, the power that is in the Torah is so great and it is so mighty that if there's a Klal Yisrael, there's a nation that is far from what it means to be a Jew, if there's people that are sitting in Yerushalayim and they are sinning, Rahman al-Islam, if only they would see the goodness and the quality and the beauty and the purity of the Torah, that would reunite them like it says, like Baruch says in Eicher Halavai Oisi Oisri, I wish that the Jewish people would just abandon me, Mishmarti, but my Torah, they would learn and they would keep. Ki or because the light that is in the Torah, Machzir in the Muta will bring a person back to the proper path. Uri Zohar was just nifty, who just passed away. He was perhaps in our generation, he was like the quintessential success story of a Baal Tshuva. He was the man that was famous in Hollywood in Israel, famous in TV in Israel, famous in, in the, even in the radio in Eretz Israel. He lived a life of luxury, a life of wealth, a life of taiva, of desires. He had everything you could possibly imagine. And he was very distant from Yiddishkeit to the extent that he would make fun of it and he would scoff at it. He wanted nothing to do with it at all. He one day met a yid by the name of, I think, Rav Zilberman, if I'm not mistaken. 
And this Jew began answering a lot of his questions, and slowly but surely, Rav Zohar became a Balchuva, Gemara, a complete Balchuva. <clears throat> Today, or before he passed away, he was a man that was living sparsely in a small little one-bedroom apartment, I believe, in B'nai Brak, towards the end of his life, where he sat and he learned in Koyla all day long, basically, and he was Makar of people the rest of the time. He had almost nothing left in the physical world, just HaKadosh Baruch in his time. So, so he's very big into a, an organization called Lev La'achim. Lev La'achim goes around and they go to all the far-flung corners of Israel and they knock on people's doors who are not religious. They say, we came to learn with you. So if they don't shut the door on your face, you get inside and you start learning with them. And thousands of people have become Bali Tshuva as a result of this. So they came to Rizora once, who's like the, who's like the leader of the organization. And they asked him, you know, we go to somebody's house, they're not from, they're not religious. Chiloni legamri. Totally not religious at all in Eretz Israel. So what should we learn with them? You have maybe one time to learn with them. What should you learn with a guy that you never, never learned one piece, of, one piece of Torah before? What do you learn with him? So they were expecting to say, you know, you take out the Chumash, Breshis Bar Lakim, the beginning, Shalom how the world was created. Maybe you'll take out a Mesil Sisharim and you'll show them what the meaning of life is, the mission of a person in this world. Maybe you go Pirki Avos, it's good lessons, lessons that everybody can relate to. It's relatable. Why don't you learn that with him? So he's always said, Bava Kama. Bava Kama. You should learn Bava Kama. So Bava Kama is an intricate Mesechta tractate in Shas, deals with laws and damages, a lot of different complicated lumbas and cheshbonas that a person has to hold to be able to understand. So they looked at him, Baba Kama, Rabbi, you got like one chance with these people over here. So why did you learn something that's going to like mesmerize them? Bring out the Kabbalah Sefer, bring out some zone, do something. So he looked at him, he says, you don't believe in the Kaya HaTorah. You don't believe in the power of Torah. If you would believe in the power of the Torah, you would understand that you take a Jew that is unaffiliated. He doesn't know anything about Yiddishkeit, but he's got a neshama, a Torah, a beautiful soul that's inside of him. And that neshama is covered up by so much schmutz from this world, so much grime and dirt and filth. And he's got to get inside of his neshama to access it. How's he going to do it? He says, you sit down, you live above a Kaaba with him. You start learning the words of Chazal, you start learning the Gemara, you start making his mind work. And he has to break himself to understand what's going on. He says that person is going to begin to open up their neshama like they never opened up before. And that's the person that will begin to connect with the Torah. Yeshia Melech, he understood the Kaya HaTayra. He understood what a person could accomplish by learning so he went along on a Renaissance mission to Klau Yisrael. And he said, let's learn. Come to a shir. Come to a gathering. Let's get a lecture. Let's learn about a comment together. Let's learn Mesut HaSisham. Let's learn what it means to be a Jew. And he was Makariv, hundreds and thousands and thousands of Jewish people during that time because he had faith in the Torah. And this is something that for ourselves, we have to begin to have a little bit more faith in the Torah in our lives as well. The Torah is the answer to every single question that you have in life. The Torah has the chizuk, the strength that you need for what you are going through in life. The Torah gives you a perspective, it gives you an outlook, a shkafa, a vision, gives you a vision of who you are, of what it means to be a Jew of what's going on in the world today, of Ma'ashem O'kech HaShom, what HaKadosh Baruch want from me. Only the Torah gives all of that. You're not going to find it in Barnes and Nobles. You're not going to find it in some TED Talk. That's going to be some, that'll be interesting. That might, not TED, not your talk, TED, TED, TED Talk, yeah? Something called TED, yeah? Not TED Fox Talks, yeah? You're a Torah dick here. So this is what we're saying over here is that a person has to begin to believe that the Torah has everything that we need 
to live our lives. And we don't have to turn elsewhere to try to figure things out. It's like the famous mushal. Imagine that you were dropped in a room and there's a, a game board and there's a spinner and there's cards there. And the board has, you know, pictures and images and words. The cards have things written on there. And you look at for the there's no directions. So you look at the board and you look at the cards and you look at the spinner and you look at the dice and you figure, okay, I'll figure out this game. And you have another fellow that's with you and you come up with the rules of the game when you're playing, you're actually having a good time. The game is fun, it's exciting, it's challenging, it's fantastic. And then the creator of that game walks into the room. He sees you playing his game. And he says, well, excuse me, what are you doing? I said, well, we're playing the game over here. He says, where did you learn to play like that? He said, well, there are no rules, so we just figured it out. He says, that's not the way that you play the game. That's all wrong. He says, I made the game. I created the game. Let me tell you the rules. And he tells you rules that sometimes are totally different than the rules of the game that you made up for yourself. That's the Rebbe and that's us. You think he just dropped us into this world and he said, make it up on your own? Go do what you want? Well, that's called democracy. Yeah? That's not the world that we live in. We live in a world of Torah. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us a rule book and he gave us a clear plan of action of how we are going to live our lives when we wake up in the morning till we go to sleep at night. How to eat, how to drink, how to live, how to daven, how to pray, how to raise families, everything. It's all in the Torah. And if a person will follow what HaKadosh Baruch Hu has given us, and because we are maminim, that we believe in the Koya HaTorah itself, then you will, it'll be much easier to live a life of Torah and of mitzvahs. When you waver in your trust in the Torah, it is very hard to accept upon yourself to do what it says inside the Torah. When you don't believe that Chazal were much greater than we were, and they saw the world in a way that we cannot possibly imagine and envision. And therefore, when Chazal came along and they said certain maimorim, certain statements, or they have certain halachas that we have to keep in order to be able to protect ourselves and our sanctity. If you don't believe that Chazal were light years ahead of us, you'll have a very hard time keeping the misses and the advice of Chazal. But once that you understand that Chazal were malachim, they were angels, they were tzaddikim, they were more malach, they were more angel than they were a human being. Their minds were totally dovak in total connection to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. All of the Torah was on their fingertips, in their heart, in their mind, in their soul. And therefore they saw the world, not like us, they saw the world in reality. Then you can trust them what they say. And therefore even if they say something that is counterintuitive to the way that we think, then we have to accept upon ourselves, I'm the one that is not thinking right. Chazal are the ones that have their head on straight. You have to believe in the Kaya HaTorah. And the more that a Jew believes in the Kaya HaTorah, in the strength and the power and the, the nitzchios, the eternal beauty and the glory of the Torah, the easier it's going to be to keep it, the more meaningful that it's going to become to us, and the more successful we will be in our Shmir HaMitzvah and our Mitzvah observance. One of the famous uh, Dashanim orators of the past generation, really this one, he just passed away several years ago, was of Yankala Galinsky. Of Yanka Galinsky was a man who went through Siberia, he went through the war, he was a Talmud of the altar of Navardok. He was a man of tremendous, <clears throat> tremendous Amun and Bitochen. He has many, many stories about his own miraculous life, how he survived, how he was tortured, how it's impossible that this man, he's about, he was about this tall, how he was able to survive all the things that he went through, but he survived. Because he had a Muna Mitachin, he trusted in HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Hashem is going to take care of him. And he was a man who lived with a lot of Ashkach Pratis. He always saw the Yad Hashem, Hashem's hand around him. And the story goes like this. There was a Rav Yankel Galinsky was once standing on a street in Menebra, and he was looking for a ride home. Imagine this chashev is such a, he was such a chashev, such a prominent person. 
but he didn't have a driver, he didn't have a car, he didn't have anything to take him. So he's standing on the street waiting for someone to take him home. So as he's standing there, a car pulls up, and there's a middle-aged Sephardish fellow in the car, and he says, Rav, can I give you a ride? So Galinsky looks in, he says, well, where are you going? He says, wherever you are going, that's exactly where I'm going. Please come, come into the car. So the uncle says, well, I want to go to Yushalayim. He makes a joke. He's in the neighbor, I want to go to Yushalayim. So he says, fine, so come in, I'll take you to Yushalayim. So the uncle gets in, he sees the man is serious over here. He's going to take him wherever he wants to go. So he gets into the car and he says, he says, Rabbi Galinsky, you might not know me. He says, but I know you and I owe you my entire life. And then the man begins to tell him the following story. He says, when I was a teenager, I was going through a very difficult time in my life. Difficult with my family, especially my father, he says, it was very, very tough on me. Learning in yeshiva was not going well, and I was always getting into trouble. So I finally decided, you know what, it's enough. I had enough. I had enough of this. Yeshiva's not working out. The family's not working out. The learning's not working out. I'm done with Torah. That's it. I'm finished. <clears throat> so I heard about a Moshav up north. And this Moshav was famous because they took boys and girls from religious families who no longer wanted to be religious, and they acclimat acclimated them to the non-religious lifestyle. So I said, what a great idea. I'll go to this Moshav. I'll live my life. I'll get away from everything over here that's driving me crazy. It'd be perfect. So he said, I'm getting ready to go to, the, to this Moshav. The problem is, I don't have a penny to my name. And the only way to get to the Moshav is to take a bus. The only way to, to get to the Moshav is to take a bus. I don't have money for a bus. So nobody was home. So I went into my parents' bedroom. I knew where my father kept his money. I opened up the top drawer. I took the bus money from my father. Last time I'm going to be there anyway. I take the bus money and I go out the house. Now as I'm walking out the house and walking towards the bus stop, I realize already the afternoon, I haven't eaten anything the whole day. Can't go back home now because I just left my house. So I got to get something to eat. But I have no money. So what am I supposed to do? So I'm walking past a base midrash and I see that it's swarming with people and I see a sign up on the door and the sign on the door says over there that there, the, it, says, it says like this that there's a special shear on that day because there was a holiday that was going on people were off of work so it was like a, like a, a day off so they had a, a day of learning he says but the best thing was what it said on the bottom it said free food I said great free food I don't have any money I'm hungry, I need to eat. I'll go in there. I'll pretend I'm going to the shi and I'll eat the food. He says, I go into the room and I sit down and there's cake and there's cookies and there's nash and there's coffee and soda and drinks. It was a machaya. And I start eating, but I'm in the room where the shear is going on. You, Rabbi Galinsky, were in the, in the middle of giving a shear at that time. And I hear you going on, Tyra! I'm not even paying attention. He says, but as I'm sitting there eating and I'm listening to your voice and I hear the sincerity and the warmth and the enthusiasm and you're talking about a Torah life and what Torah does for a person and it's the greatest thing in the world and we have to see what it means to be a Jew and how to become better in this and grow more. Suddenly I put down the food and I found myself mesmerized by the message that you were giving, I never heard how wonderful the Torah could be the way they heard it from you. When the shir was over, I decided I'm not going to that Moshav. I'm going to go back to Yeshiva and I'm going to remain within the fold of Torah and stay a real Jew. A real Jew. I went back to my house. I put the money in the drawer. I never told my parents what happened. I went back to yeshiva. I began to find the good in Torah, the good in mitzvahs, the good in my family. Today he said, Baruch Hashem, I'm a very happy young man, married with children, living a Torah, the lifestyle, all because of you, Rabbi Galinsky. So if Yaakov Galinsky laughed, and he took it as a message for himself, you never know 
where your words are going to hit. You never know how they're going to penetrate. You never know who's going to benefit from that which you have to say. But the message for us as well is that if we would just believe in the beauty of a Torah life, if we would just believe that the Torah has every single thing that we need to answer all of our questions, it'll give us hope and direction and clarity. So then we'd be so much more excited to be the Torah Jews that we are and that we are trying to become. And then we wouldn't struggle. You know, some people, we struggle with the same mitzvahs years and years and years and years and years and years on end. If we believe in the power of the Torah and the Torah says, keep that mitzvah, why wouldn't we do it? If we would believe when the Torah says how important it is to daven with a minion and to learn together and to have a shear, and to, then why would we miss? Only because we don't truly believe in the Kayach Torah. Once we chazik ourselves in that area, like again, like we see Yeshia Melech, he was about tshuva basically. He didn't even know what it meant to be a full-fledged Torah Jew. But once that he realized what it was all about, he said, this is the meaning of life. i got to share this with the rest of Klal Yisrael. He made a Project Inspired video that he showed the other night. Yeah? To show everybody... He's going to get the joke, I guess. Yeah? <laughs> Just wanted to show everybody what it means to be a Jew. Because when you believe, that's the difference between someone that is successful in Kirov and someone that is not successful. If you go into Kirov because... You just need something to do with your life. So then everybody will smell it out when you start giving them a class and you talk about this, you talk about that. There's no heart behind it. But if you love Torah and you love mitzvahs and you love what it means to be a Jew, so then when you give it over to somebody else, it goes into that person. We should be Zaycheh and Mirza Hashem to recognize the tremendous kayach, the power that is in the Torah. To see what the Torah does for us, how it shapes and forms our lives, how it gives us a sense of meaning and a sense of self. It gives us purpose and mission in this world. And in that zechos, in Yitz Hashem, as Yeshua Melech was the one that was Makarif, so many of the Yidin that were far away from the Torah at that time, at least let us have the zechos to be Makarif ourselves and those around us. Kina number Yud Aleph, number 11. I Please <laughs> do Oh, <laughs> 
Holding over here in Kina, Yud Base number 12, <clears throat> the Pasik that is brought down from Eicha that says, Lama la netzach tishacheinu, why have you forgotten us forever? Tazveinu la'orech yomim, you abandon us la'orech yomim for the length of days. That means that when a person finds themselves in the, or Klal Yisrael over here, we, the Yemiyo is lamenting. That as Klal Yisrael finds itself in the Golas, in the deep, and the dark exile, and the Beis Hamikdash is being destroyed, Klal Yisrael is going far away from the homeland. So it feels like, for the Jew, it feels like an eternity. It feels like there is no way for us to recognize and be cognizant of the Rebbein Shalom. And Ragam Lir writes over here, Kesha Adam Shroi B'Tzara, when a person is in a state of difficulty, chas v'sholom, God forbid, every moment of suffering that they are in is like netzach, it feels like an eternity. When a person is in pain, sometimes that pain feels like it's forever. That's what it means over here. Lama l'netzach yishkacheinu, when HaKadosh Baruch conceals himself, and it's so difficult to find him. It's very hard. Until it looks like he checked out, he's gone, and there's no way to find him. Therefore we are... Asking the Rebbein Shoilam, Hashivena Hashem Elechem and Ashuva. That's the next verse over here. Hashivena Hakadosh Baruch Hu, return us. When Ashuva will return to you, Chadesh Yameinu Kekedem. We will then, we will then return to you like we were in pre, in, we were previously. So the the Pasuk over here is telling us a similar ideas to what we've been speaking about the whole morning, because. If we can walk away with this message, it will give us a lot of strength, a lot of chizik in our own lives. And that is that even in the world of Hester upon him, even when HaKadosh Baruch is hiding his face, it doesn't mean that HaKadosh Baruch is not here. When you go and you play hide and go seek, and you one person is hiding and the other person is looking for them, the person that is hiding is there. It's not like they're not in the room or they're not in the on the... In the yard, they are there. You just can't see them. And your job is to go and to find them. You have to seek them out. When we live in a world of Hester Panim, in a world where our Kodesh Baruch Hu's face, his essence is concealed, like a world that we are living in today, it means that our Kodesh Baruch Hu is here. It's just that he wants us to go and seek him out to be able to find him so that we should once again be reunited together with Hashem. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu is telling Klal Yisrael a message for all the generations, that although you're going to be in places where you are not going to see me, I don't know how many people see HaKadosh Baruch Hu on Ventura Boulevard. I'm not sure that he's hanging out there too much. I don't know how many people see HaKadosh Baruch Hu in your car, wherever you're going, or when you're on an airplane. You know, you imagine the, 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 the far city of it all. If you're getting on a plane, you're going to fly to Eretz HaKadosh, the Holy Land itself. Everybody's got screens in front of their seat. 
They're watching znus, they're watching murder, they're watching craziness, they're watching sports, but you're heading off there to Israel. So it's the hest upon him. HaKadosh Baruch has concealed himself in the world that we live in today. Nevertheless, says HaKadosh Baruch Hu, keep looking for me. I'm right there. And if we know what we're searching for, we know what we're looking for, shouldn't it forget us forever. It feels like forever. It feels like we're all on our own. And yet we know that we're never on our own. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is right there. I heard a Maisa recently about... Uh, a uh, very Hashem Rosh Hashiv in New York by the name of Chaim Epstein. And Rav Chaim Epstein had a yeshiva, and he was well known to be very astute and attuned to people and dealing with them and understanding them and their problems. There was once a terrible blizzard in New York, and the uh, sanitary service was not running for several days, which means that the trash wasn't being taken out and people's homes were beginning to smell, and it was piling up on the snow-covered streets of New York over there. It was very difficult. One morning at 2 o'clock in the morning, Chaim Epstein is probably sitting and learning, and he suddenly hears from outside, he hears the garbage truck coming down the street. So he quickly gathers all the trash that he can in his house. He runs out the door, and he sees the trash truck, the, the garbage truck beginning to pull away, and he starts screaming, wait, 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 wait. And he's carrying, running with two bags of trash, and he gets it in there, and they take the bags from the rabbi. As he starts thanking them, thank you, thank you very much, as he's about to go, one of the drivers says, are you a rabbi? <clears throat> so he says, um, yes, I am. He says, rabbi, maybe you could help me. Here we are, 2 o'clock in the morning, New York City, garbage man. He says, my name is Theodore. He says, I'm a Jew also. He says, I just heard from the hospital that my mother just passed away. He said, I have a really big problem, Rabbi. My mother left in her will that she wants to be cremated, and my other siblings are on board to cremate her. But I don't feel right. I'm a Jew. It's after the Holocaust. How can we put a person in? How can we cremate them after all the Jews went up in the, in the incinerators, in the crematoriums? I can't, I can't do such a thing. Rabbi, I need your help. What can I do? So if Chaim Epstein sees the hashkacha of this moment, and he's like, okay, listen to me, what are you going to do? He says, in the morning, when the, when the funeral parlor opens up, you need to call first thing in the morning, Tell them that I told you to call and tell them that you need to make the levi, you need to make the funeral today. It's very important to make the funeral today. Then I want you to call the hospital. Tell the hospital that the Herba Kedish is coming to take the body because they have to get the body ready for the, for the funeral. And then after everything is done and the Herba Kedish picked up the body and it's on the way to the funeral parlor, parlor then you call your siblings and you tell them that, that mom passed away last night and she's already at the funeral parlor. They already took her and the funeral is going to be this morning at 11 o'clock. He said, here's my number. If you run into any problems, give me a call, please. First thing in the morning, Theodore calls the, the Beis HaKvar, the cemetery. He tells them that my mother passed away last night. Rabbi Chaim Epstein told me that we have to make the funeral today. Oh, Rabbi Epstein, okay, we're going to do everything we can in our abilities. He calls the Hebrew Kedisha. He calls the Hebrew Kedisha and he tells them, my mother passed away, she's in the hospital, please bring her to this cemetery, no problem. Everything is moving, everything's in motion, the body's on the way, getting ready to come to the cemetery. He calls his siblings, he says, I'm sorry to tell you, mommy passed away last night at the hospital. He said, and I worked everything out already. It's her last, it's the last wish that she should really have is. She should be buried in a funeral parlor. She'd be buried in the way of a Jew. And I already arranged for her to be buried in there. And she's not going to be cremated. They were a little disappointed. Because it's a hassle now. They have to go to a funeral. Now if they want to visit her, they have to go and see her in the cemetery. They were going to divide her up into pieces. And each baby would keep a little piece of her in their house. So whenever they wanted to see her, they would just go to a little piece. 
But they saw that it was already a done deal, and they said, okay, what can we do? Fine. She's going to have a funeral. He's so excited. He calls Rabbi Epstein. He says, Rabbi Epstein, he said, everything you told me to do, I did it work out exactly as planned. The funeral is going to be today at 11 o'clock in the morning. Rabbi Epstein, you're the only rabbi I know. <laughs> Could you please come and run the funeral? Could you officiate the, uh, officiate the funeral? So Rabbi Epstein said, I, I, don't, I don't even know your mother. I don't, I, please, I'll tell you something special about her. He said, we grew up with not much religion. I, we didn't really know much, but we knew that we were Jewish. How do we know that we're Jewish? Because every Friday night, my mother would light the Shabbos candles. That was the extent of our Judaism growing up, that every Friday night, without fail, my mother would always light the Shabbos candles. And that's why I know that it's important to her that she has a Jewish burial. So if he says, fine, I'm coming. I'll see you there. And he comes to the funeral, and there's a small crowd, him and the siblings, basically, maybe a few other family members. It was a cold day, you have to imagine. The snow, it's graveside. They're trying to get things over quickly. And he says, how befitting that a woman who spent her whole life lighting the fires of the Shabbos candle would be saved from the fires of being cremated at the end of her life. That I would end up being there at 2 o'clock in the morning and meeting her son Theodore. And Theodore would come and he would ask me if I could help him out with the funeral and everything worked out so quickly as it did today. To me, it's a sign that in the merit of this woman for what she did in her life for Judaism and for God, God did for her today. Everybody was very touched and moved by his words. The funeral came and the funeral went. A few days later, the garbage man, uh, so then what happened? It's Shiva. And he kept waiting to hear from Theodore. If he was going to call him, ask him maybe questions this and that. It's over. He tried calling a few times, couldn't get through. Fine, after Shiva, check on, couldn't get through. After the Shiva's over, the, the garbage truck is coming down the street one day. And Chaim Epstein runs out to the garbage truck. And he says, Theodore, Theodore, where are you, Theodore? So, no Theodore. So the garbage men say, who are you looking for? He says, you know, Theodore, the guy that's on the truck over here. The one that I met uh, a week ago in the middle of the night. He was, Theodore? Who's Theodore? They said, you know, the guy, the nice guy, the, Theodore. Oh, Theodore. He's not on this route. What do you mean he's not on this route? He was on this route. He was on this route last, a week ago, he was on this route. No, you don't understand. What happened was because of all of the, all of the storm and the blizzard and everything was backed up, and this particular area was very, very bad, they started <clears throat> shipping in a garbage men from other places in New York, New Jersey area. Theodore, he's not from New York. He's from someplace else. He came in to help out. You'll never see him again, Rabbi. So then he said to himself, the following, you look how HaKadosh Baruch Hu will do for a person to take care of them even at the final moments of their life. You have a woman, she has a decree against her, she should be cremated. She has one son named Theodore who doesn't want to cremate her. There's a blizzard in New York. In order for the trash to be taken out from that area, Theodore is called in from wherever, Jersey, wherever he was, and he comes down that street at 2 o'clock in the morning. The street where Chaim Epstein lives, who happens to be up in the, at 2 o'clock in the morning learning Torah, runs out and he says, you're a rabbi? What hashkoch, you're a rabbi? My mother just died right now. He worked everything out in order to make sure that this woman would have the final resting place in a bekovedik in an honorable way. Don't ask, He has never left us. He never abandoned us. It might look like it, it might feel like it, it might seem like it. But if the Rebbe Nishayim could send Theodore to a street in New York City in a blizzard at 2 o'clock in the morning in the snow, only that Rav Chaim Esin run out and they should meet and they should arrange and, and they should create a funeral service for his mother where she won't have to be cremated and everybody's going to go along with it. 
So then just as HaKadosh Baruch doesn't forget about the woman who lit Shabbos candles all of her life on Friday night, and he orchestrates all the events to make them the way that they are, certainly HaKadosh Baruch Hu will orchestrate and arrange the events for us as well, and he will not abandon us the Orech Yomim for a length of days. Rather, he's hidden, but he's there. And we just have to seek him out and find him. Kina Yud Beis number 12. <laughs> Rashta Raganto, Vianto Madino, the <laughs> Skipping now to <clears throat> Kina number Chaf Aleph number 21, known as the Arze Halavonoin, which is speaking about the Harugi Machus Asar, the Asar Harugi Machus, which was the 10 holy martyrs that were killed in a horrific way because the king wanted to take out restitution on the Jewish people because he found out that there was once a story in the Chumash of Yosef HaTzadik, whose brothers had thrown him into the pit and thrown him into exile and had sent him away as a slave into Mitzrayim. And the, the, Roman, the Romans realized that the Jewish people seemingly were never held accountable to such a thing. We don't find that the brothers were actually ever punished and he felt that it was a, a mission and a mitzvah perhaps to bring about a consequence and a punishment to the Jewish people. So just as there were 10 brothers that were involved in the selling 
of Yosef Atzadik. He decided that there's going to be 10 great sages that are going to have to be killed and murdered uh, brutally in order to make some kind of a tikkun for the sale of Yosef Atzadik. I heard recently from my Rosh Hashiv Rav Aaron Feldman in, in Neri Yisrael that he said, why is it that, that this Yosef HaTzadik is so tied up with the day of Tisha B'Av that we should end up reading this very painful and difficult kina that deals with the death of these 10 great tzaddikim? Why, what does Yosef HaTzadik have to do with Tisha B'Av? And he said very simply, he said, we know that the reason that the Beis HaMikdash was destroyed was because of Sinas Chinam, because the Jewish people had a very baseless hatred one for the other. And we spoke many times in the past and many times over the last several weeks about the root and the cause of that Sinas Chinam. He says, if you look at the story of Yosef HaTzadik, he was a young man that was precious in the eyes of his father. He had a lot that was going for him. And he also, he stoked the fires of jealousy, as we would say, by wearing his fancy coat, by telling his brothers his dreams, by claiming that he was a greater person on a level, on a, level a higher level than the brothers were. So when, what ended up happening? The brothers came to despise their brother, Yosef. The Pasuk says over there, by like they came to hate him. Now, why did they come to hate him? They came to hate him because, as the Archaim HaKadosh writes, they could not be makabal on themselves. They could not accept the fact that HaKadosh Baruch Hu put Yosef in a certain position, and he put them in another position. Yosef was going to be the leader. Yosef would be the one that would take on, take on the level of leadership and the mantle after his father Yaakov was in this world. And they would end up being the brothers. They would end up being the rest of the shift they call the rest of the tribes. They would have their job and their mission, but it wasn't the mission of Yosef Atzani. And that bothered them. And as a result of them letting it bother them to the extent that it brought them to jealousy, and the jealousy brought them to kina, to, to, brought them to hatred, the hatred itself ended up causing them to take their brother, the, their own brother, the son of, Yosef, of Yaakov Avinu, and take him and rip up his jacket into shreds, covered in blood, lie to the father, throw him into a pit, sell him as a slave to Mitzrayim, to be out of sight, out of mind, to leave him alone forever. Until in the very, very end of the story, they have charata, they have regret. They meet up with Yosef once more. They apologize, and Yosef tells them, what are you apologizing for? Everything that happened is the hand of Hashem. You thought to do bad to me, HaKadosh Baruch Hu saw much better. He said, all, everything was in mind to do good. Says Rav says Aaron Feldman, that's the reason that we read this particular kina on Tisha B'Av. Because the reason that the Esau Rug Malchus took place, the reason that this wicked Roman king decided he's going to kill the Jewish people, is based upon the story of Yosef HaTzadik. And Yosef HaTzadik is the story of Sinas Chinam. And our mission on, on Tisha B'Av is to eradicate the Sinas Chinam that there is in our lives and bring us to a place, to a level of whether it's going, of Avas Yisrael, V'yafta L'Reyecha Kamaycha, to love another Jew the way that you would love yourself. I just heard a story just recently. Some of you probably heard the Misa already. There was a uh, family, they were very close friends, very close friends for years and years and years. And the wives were good friends, the husbands were good friends, they did a lot of things together. <clears throat> Even on maybe uh, something, whatever, six, seven years ago, they hosted Sheva Brachis together, they did a lot of things together. And one of the women ended up misunderstanding something that the other, per the other woman did, and uh, a machlekes, an argument ensued between them. And the other woman tried to say, I, I did nothing wrong, there's nothing over here, please don't get upset. And the other woman, you know how the world of machlekes of fighting works? The other woman got really angry and upset, and she began to bear a grudge of sin of hatred against this other woman for years and years and years. We'll, we'll give them names, okay? The woman who is the woman who hates is Miriam, and the woman who doesn't deserve to be hated 
Let's call her Leah. So Miriam hates Leah for the last six, seven years. And Leah doesn't understand what all this hatred is about. But she, whatever, it is what it is. Fast forward to recently. And the son-in-law of Miriam has a failing kidney. And he needs a kidney donor. And how it works is you go through the process, you take all your tests and all your exams, and they try to find a perfect match for the donor. So they send out, you know, on the WhatsApp, and they send out in the, in the, uh, in the emails, please, we're looking for a match. Could you please come and get tested to see if perhaps this, if you're a match for this person? At the same exact time, Leah has a son. Leah is the one that is hated, but she doesn't hate the other woman. She has a son, and he goes through the testing of the, of the kidney. Of, he has, he's on file over there. And lo and behold, it turns out that the son of Leah is a perfect match for the son-in-law of Miriam. And so they ask him, would you like, now the way that it works in these organizations usually is, you don't know who you are going to be a match for. That's all part of the, part of the amazing thing. I'm willing to give my kidney to a total stranger. So they asked the son of Leah, we found someone that is a perfect match for you. Would you like to give your kidney? And the man says, yes, of course I would. So the way that it works in kidney transplants is that on the day that it is decided, both the recipient and the giver of the kidney are both having surgeries simultaneously in the same hospital. And they're removing the kidney from one and they're transferring it to the body of the recipient. So the mother, Leah, is, and her husband and family are there in the hospital to support their son who's about to have his kidney removed to be able to donate it and, and give it over to somebody, to this other person. And as they're sitting there in the waiting room and they're saying their Tehillim and everything, getting ready for the surgery, in walks the arch nemesis, Miriam. And she walks into the hospital waiting room and she sees Leah there. And she says, chutzpah, on the day that my son-in-law is having a kidney transplant, as a chutzpah, you come to make me feel bad. What a chutzpah. And she walks over and says, how could you do this? You know what we're going through. You know what my family's going through right now. My son-in-law has to have a kidney transplant and you're here. So Leah looks at her and she says, Miriam, do you have any idea why we're in the hospital? She said, my son is giving a kidney of his today. Do you know who he's giving it to? He's giving it to your son-in-law. At that moment, the woman broke down and started crying. And all of the foolishness and all of the ridiculousness and all the machlekes of the last six, seven years falls away like that. Says of Aaron Feldman, the reason that we read this kina today on Tisha B'Av is because we have to remind ourselves what brought Klal Yisrael down to Mitzrayim in the first place. What brought us to Mitzrayim was a maisa, was an act of sinas chinam, the brothers of Yosef Atzadik. Now, they were great people, which is a little bit hopeful for us. If the greatest uh, sibling rivalry in the history of the world could produce sinas chinam of such an extent that Klal Yisrael went down to Mitzrayim, all of the gullahs took place as a result of that. We end up eventually coming out and receiving a Torah, and then we only blow it in the midbar to the Chedah Maraglim. If all of that started with the greatest men of all time, so it's understandable that we ourselves make our mistakes in the world of sinas chinam. But it's not an excuse for us to live with sinas chinam. We have to repair and we have to change and we have to work on it by having the afto l'reecho kamaycha, by loving your fellow Jew the way that you love yourself. And that's the other part of this kina. And this is when we mourn the loss of the great Tanoim Amaroyim of this time, the great Tzadikim, 
we may we also have in mind for ourselves of all the generations the loss of the great and the righteous Sadiqim Tamid Chachamim who perished from this land and are lo- no longer here. Rav Chaim Kanievsky, there's many stories about him. On one hand, you hear him to be this big cerebral person whose mind was always in learning, but yet at the same time, you hear stories about him that he was a very emotional, very sensitive, very gentle person who somebody else's troubles could pierce their heart. And it's brought down that every single year by this particular Tehillim, by this one, when he would think about the the tragedies that went on, when he would think about the suffering of these great sages, and he would think about what we lost, Reb Chaim would break down and he would cry during this Tehillim because that's the import of it. But we have to realize what we lost when we lose Tamil Chacham, we lose our Gedolim. There's a beautiful Maisa with the Ponovich Arav. The Ponovich Arav was known Probably everybody knows him more for his emotions than they know that he was one of the, the greatest Tamil Chachamim of the time. He he once they once asked him, How come you don't write Swarim? He was such a massive Tamil Chacham. Why did you write Swarim? You have so many Chidushim. So many, I'm too busy taking care of the broken hearts of Klau Yisrael. I don't have time to write Swarim. So once the Pun of Ijarov needed a very large amount of money as a loan. And he called, I believe, a Rav Berman in B'nai Brak. And he told him, I, I need you to get for me a certain amount of money. It was a large amount. He said, I need to pay off certain debts that I have right now for the yeshiva. Please procure the money. I have a big meeting with Rabbanim in Yushalayim today. I'm not going to be in B'nai Brak. But I need the money as soon as I come back. So do me a favor, just get the money. Bring it to my office, put it in my desk drawer. So when I come back to that, I'll have the money, I can begin paying off whatever, whatever debts I have. So Berman said, no problem. No problem. He knew where to go. He knew to speak to. He amassed this very nice sum of money. And he heads over to the Panovich Yeshiva. And he comes to the door of the Panovich Yerav's office. Now he knows, Rav Kahneman said, he's in Yushalayim that day. So he doesn't knock. He opens up the door, and as he opens the door, he looks inside, and he sees the Panovich Rav holding a young child like this, and the Rav and the child are crying like babies. And the Panovich Rav looks up, and Rav Berman says, Rebbe, I, I, I thought you were going to be in your shlava. I'm sorry to interrupt. He, he says, what is the Rav doing here? He says, you know, every time that I leave the Nebrak, even if I just take a trip for the day to Yushalayim, I always go to the Bate Avais. He had an orphanage for boys and girls. I always go and I check in. I make sure that everybody's doing well. And if they need anything, I want to take care of it. I want to make sure that everybody is in a good place. He said, I stopped today in the Bate Avais in the orphanage home. And as I walk in, I see that this boy over here, he's crying. And I asked one of the staff there, what's the matter? Why is he crying? They said, this boy lost everything in the Holocaust. His father, his mother, his siblings, he lost it all. But today he just found out that his best friend in the world perished in the Holocaust as well. And he's been unconsolable all morning long. We don't know what to do. So the Panevich Rav with eyes puffy and red and tears in his eyes, looks at Rabbi Berman and he says, he says, the G'dayalim in Yerushalayim will have to wait for me. This boy needs me right now. We have to sit here and cry together over the loss that he has. His loss is my loss and what pains him, pains me. That's what it means, a God of Yisrael. Someone who's avas Yisrael, is love of the Jewish people. He has a meeting of Gedoyle Yisrael waiting for him in Yushalayim. But he didn't go. Because a young boy, a broken soul, is crying and bereft of his family and his best friend. So the point of which Rav stays there. The reason that HaKadosh Baruch Hu brought about this terrible destruction and heartache to Klau Yisrael was because of the Sinas Chinam that goes back to the brothers of Yosef at Sadiq. And the way that we will correct it is to go into a world and a realm of Avas Yisrael, 
the way that we learn from our Gedoinim, and in that Zechus and Yitz Hashem, we could help to be Mesakin to correct the sins of the past. When Kina number 21. want to conclude with skipping towards the end of the Kinois, we find that the Kinois deal with many, many of the tragedies that transpired over the generations for Klal Yisrael, the Crusades are in there. There are many, the Korban Abayis, Risha and Vesheni, certain things are left out for reasons, but after the, after World War II and after the Holocaust and after so many hidden perished, so 
many of the G'dayla you saw felt that perhaps it was appropriate to insert a kina in memory of those who lost their lives during the Holocaust. And we have two that were that are brought down in, in our version of the Kinois. One is by Rav Shlomo Havishtam, who was the Baba Varebbe, and the other one was by Rav Shimon Schwab, who was the Rav of Kahala Das Yishun in the upper, I believe in, in Manhattan, in the Upper West Side. And the two of them wrote very touching and poignant words to describe to us what it is that we lost, what it means to have a korban. This is a korban that is still something that we are attached to. There are still survivors that are left in the world, although it's getting smaller and smaller, the numbers. But there are survivors that are left in the world. That means there are people who walk through the fires of Auschwitz that are still alive. There are people that rode on the cattle cars that can tell you the stories about being squeezed a hundred people into a stuffy cattle car with no bathrooms for days on end. And they could describe to you all of the horrific conditions that they had to go through. They can tell you what it was like to look at Mengele when he was deciding, should you go right to life, should you go left to death, and your life was holding on a, on, on a, on a thread at that moment. They can tell you what it was like to see death all around them, to see the stench of the crematoriums. They can tell you all that. And therefore, it was very important that they put inside of the kino is something to remind us that as much as Klal Yisrael is not living with the Chorban Abayis anymore, and we don't see the we don't see the pogroms in our days, we don't see inquisitions, but it's not long ago. And perhaps this is what it means that when the world has made a very big mistake that we shall never forget. What does it mean we shall never forget? What does that statement mean? I don't even know if they know what it means. To try to pacify our guilt as Jews. Never forget what happened. It's much more than that. Never forget that these are the things that could happen and they did happen and they will happen. Rahman al Islam. When a nation forgets who they are, we can never forget. And that's really what the Pasuk is. I think at the end of Yad Vashem, a friend of mine once pointed this out to me. At the end of Yad Vashem, when you walk through the whole thing, which by the way is a very depressing place to go because they just minimize, they minimize the glory of the Jewish spirit, they minimize the glory of Klal Yisrael. They just make it into such a secularized place to show what the Holocaust was. They don't even show you what was going on over there. They don't show you the spirit of Klal Yisrael. We survived and triumphed over all the evil in the world. Yes, it's true that there was a lot of death and destruction, that's all true, but Klal Yisrael continues to survive. They missed the whole point. So it's a very sad place, very uninspiring to be a Jew after you go through there. And the very end, they quote a Pasik. And the, the Pasik is over there, it's in one of the Shesh Zahir, it's one of the six things you remember at the, at the end of every day. Al Tishkach, you should not forget what your eyes have seen. And that's all that they say. You should not forget what your eyes have seen. But they forget the rest of the Pasik. You should not forget what your eyes have seen when you were standing on Har Sinai. Because that's the ikr. The ikr of the life of a Jew is what did we see when we were standing at Har Sinai? We saw Shechina, we saw Moshe Rabbeinu, we saw the Torah coming down, Mina Shemaim. we received the Torah, we know what it means to be a Jew. So if all you're going to do is not forget tragedy and suffering and pain and death and pogroms and all, if all that's all you're going to forget, and we're forgetting the main thing. The main thing is that this is all part of the Jewish experience. This is all part of what Klal Yisrael goes through in every single generation. The Holocaust is closest to home because that's what happened in the last 80 years. But the Inquisition and the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash and the pogroms and the Crusades were as vicious and as evil and as wicked and therefore, this is all part of the chain of history of who we are and what we are all about. And therefore, it was encapsulated inside of one of these two keynotes that we have over here. I remember that when Rav Chaim Halpern used to come, Chaim Halpern was the great tzaddik from, who survived 16 concentration camps himself. The last one was Auschwitz. 
He survived 16, and the last one that he survived was Auschwitz. He said that there were times in some of the camps that the lice were so bad in those camps. They didn't, they didn't have sanitary rules over there. They weren't clean, washing them down. He said the lice had actually gone under their skin. It was inside of them. You couldn't get rid of the lice. That's how bad it was. So he went to 16 camps. The last one was Auschwitz. While he was in Auschwitz, he met with Gershon Liebman, who was the Talmud Muvak, the one of the main disciples of the altar of Nevarduk. Rav Gershon Lieben was a man that was living with the Muna and Bitachin every single day in the concentration camps. And he was Makar of this young man, Rav Chaim Halpern. And he sustained him in Ruchnias for the remainder of his days in Auschwitz. And eventually, when the war was over, they picked up and they went to France and they rebuilt the Nevarduk yeshiva system. So Rav Chaim Halpern said over the following. He said, his daughter once came to me, he says, Tati, I'm taking my son and we're going to go to Auschwitz. We want to go visit Auschwitz, where you were. He said, yes. He said, are you bringing your Coca-Cola and your banana in your purse with you? He said, if you go to Auschwitz with a bottle of Coca-Cola and a banana in your purse, you will not be able to understand at all what we went through when we were there in those camps. You're coming out of your comfortable car, you're wearing all of your nice clothing, you have money in your purse, you have a soda to drink because you're hot and you're thirsty. He says, you go there, he's told his daughter, you just have to know, you're just observing. You have no idea, you can never imagine what it is that we actually went through while we were there in those camps. And the tenacity of the Jews that survived, and even those that perished, the strength, the fortitude of what they went through, the suffering that they, in, that they, in, that they encountered, but to emerge alive. And if we look at the Jewish world today, all of the Jewish world that we have today, certainly the Ashkenazi and the Hasidic world that we have today, is all a result of the survivors of the war, who, like we mentioned from Rabbi Akiva and others before, as everybody else was sitting around and crying bitter tears, they were laughing and they were saying, we're going to rebuild our nation. If we lived to show Hitler that he can do whatever he wants and he's not going to destroy us, then we're going to take the lives that HaKadosh Baruch has given us and we are going to live them to the fullest in a life of Yadus, of Yiddishkeit, and we will, we will rebuild everything that we can to make the Jewish people a nation that is once again strong with Torah and mitzvahs. If you think about it, all of the yeshivas that there are, kimat, all of the, regu- the yeshivas in America, in Eretz Israel, even in Europe, they all started after the war from those people that survived. And they said, you're never going to put us out. You're never going to destroy us. The greatest schos, the greatest merit that we can have, the greatest proof that Klal Yisrael is Nitzchi, is eternal, is that we're going to rebuild everything you tried to destroy. <coughs> they made a calculation that there is more Torah being learned today in the world Maybe since the days of Bovel, when the Jewish people were in Babylonia and they were codifying and writing the Gemara. There are so many yeshivas. There are so many kolos. There are so many schools. I just came back recently from Lakewood. Last year I was in Lakewood for part of the summer and they were in the midst of building gigantic buildings for schools and yeshivas and kolos. They were starting to build. This year they're finished and they're filled already. And they're so filled they have to build more to get more people there, to build more buildings, because they have more people that have to be learning. All over the near yeshiva of Nasseh Finkel, he was a visionary. They once saw him on, I believe, Rosh Hashanah, <coughs> afternoon, by the davening. They noticed that he kept, kept looking out, doing maybe the repetition of the of the, of the Shmaz, he kept looking out the window. And after davening, he said, Rebbe, what are you looking at? He says, you see that piece of land over there? I'm dreaming of the next base midrash, the next base we're going to build for the Mir Yeshiva. 
And sure enough, after Yom Tov was over, he inquired about it and he bought that piece of land and he built and they built and they built tens of thousands of people that are learning. That's in one place. And the other Hasidic places and the other yeshivas and Ponovich and Slobodka and Hebron. Could you imagine walking the bases of over a thousand people sitting and learning every single day? You know the power that's in that room? And it was built by the people that survived the war. The people afterwards said, if we're going to survive and rebuild ourselves, Torah is, that has to be the foundation. And so they started all over again with determination and doing what HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted us to do, and they succeeded. Because their outlook on life was not like our outlook. If we get a scratch on our car, that's it, we're ruined. The rest of the day is ruined. You ever get a new car and get a scratch on the car? Ah! Oh! It's ruined the whole day. Now I can't, I can't, every time I look at that car, I get a bad feeling in my heart and I think about that person who scratched the car. These people, their families were scratched out. Their lives were scratched out. They could have been bitter individuals who were miserable for the rest of their lives. But they emerged from the ashes and they said, we're going to rebuild a life. We'll get married, we'll have children, and we'll make the Jewish people continue to prosper and to flourish and to grow. So I want to share with you one, one story about the tremendous power of these survivors, of how they are able to, what they were able to accomplish. It's a beautiful story about a couple that ended up getting married in the DP camps. And their, their names over here, the, 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 the young man's name was Baruch, and the woman's name, I don't see, her name was Rachel. And in the DP camps, after everybody was beginning to rehabilitate themselves, and they were in the hospitals, healing and getting nursed and cleaning up all their infections and their diseases and everything, they began already thinking, well, if we're alive, then we got to start rebuilding. We have to make a family. So this young man, Baruch, and the young lady, Rachel, they met several times. I guess like a shirach date, and there was a liking towards each other. Now Baruch's job in the camps, in the DP camps was, he was in charge of distributing shoes to all the people. You remember, you, you hear all the stories. They were literally in the freezing cold winters over there with no shoes on their feet. So for them to be able to have shoes was already, that was part of the healing and the medicine itself. So he was in charge of the shoes department. And the way that it worked was the Red Cross, whoever brought in all the shoes, he had to line them up by sizes, by styles, and then there would be a long line and everybody would come. And it was first come, first serve. You could pick out whichever shoe that you wanted. So Baruch is manning the, the, uh, manning the uh, shoe store, so to speak. And he sees Rachel walk in. They already met a few times. There was already a, they already liked each other. And he sees her looking at the shoes, and he sees right away her look, third shelf, right in the center, beautiful pair of shoes. And he knows that Rachel wants these shoes. So he thinks to himself, should I take them off the shelf now? She's going to come. It's going to look so good for the shidduch over here. She'll see that I saw. I was sensitive to her. I understood what she wanted. I took the shoes, and I gave it to her, and I saved it for her. But I can't do that. It's first come, first serve. So I'm going to leave them on the shelf. If it's meant to be for Rachel, it's meant to be for Rachel. So the line is going. One after one, the women come. I want those shoes. I want those shoes. I want those shoes. Suddenly a young, girl, a young girl, young lady comes over. She's about one or two ladies in front of Rachel. She looks at the shelf. She says to Baruch, I want those shoes. Baruch looks at the shoes, the same shoes that Rachel wanted. And he's in a dilemma right now. He could tell the girl that they're already taken. He could. <clears throat> but the girl wants him. And she also wants them. It's also going to make her happy. And it's first come, first serve. So he walks over to the shelf and he takes off the shoes. And he 
gives them over to this young lady. And in that moment, he sees Rachel lower her head and she starts crying. And he says, ah, I blew it. She wanted those shoes. But it meant the world to have those shoes. I really messed up. And she comes next in line. She points to another pair of shoes and he's, he's like trying to apologize. She takes the shoes and she leaves. The next day they have their next date. And as they sit down for the date, Baruch says, Rocha, I just, I want to apologize. When you walked into the room, I saw your eyes, look at those shoes, and I so much wanted to give you those shoes. But the rules of the place is first come, first serve, and this little girl, she also wanted the shoes. I, I didn't feel that I could take them away from her. I'm really sorry. And I made you cry because you wanted them. And she says, oh, Baruch, you don't understand why I'm crying. She said, I did want those shoes. And I was watching them the entire time. And I was so happy that every person that was coming, everyone that was coming, didn't pick them. But when I saw that young girl go walk up, and I saw the smile on her face, and I saw how much she wanted those shoes, I said to myself, I hope that Baruch is going to do the right thing and give the girl those shoes. And when you gave the girl those shoes, I lowered my head and I cried because I realized that you and I are a match made in heaven and we're going to get married to each other. And sure enough, in the DP camps, in the midst of the rebuilding of Klal Yisrael, Baruch and Leah got married to each other and they raised a family of Torah, a family of Chesed, a family of giving and of kindness. These are the people that survived. They survived with their neshamas and their strength and their amuna intact. And because of them, we are sitting here today. So we'll say, if you have in your kina, either on page 384 or 386, one of the kinois for the Chorben Europa for the Holocaust. Mm.